If I could have your attention, please. I thought maybe with the uh, soccer game next door and the band concert that we wouldn't have anybody here. But we're grateful to have you here tonight. We'd like to invite you to stand with us and join the board in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Kalinda? Mr. Applebaum? Here. Mrs. Castillo? Here. Mrs. Feldman? Here. Mr. Major? Here. Mrs. Mogerman? Here. Dr. Ciertino? Here. Mr. Jacob? Here. Thank you. 3.0 special recognitions. We have tonight five special recognitions that we're excited about. First, we're going to recognize 11 students who have been selected for the 2011 Missouri Scholars Academy. In addition, we are honoring winners of the Martin Luther King Jr. Essay Poster Contest, also Parkway NEA Scholarship winners, and we have a teacher who has received the Certificate of Merit from the Suburban Music Educators Association. And we'll be hearing from Wally Flick, President of the Alumni Association, with an update on Granting Dreams. So at this point, if you would please uh, welcome Dr. Denise Papillo, who is the coordinator Curriculum Coordinator for Gifted Services and the Coordinator of District Grants and Funding to the podium to introduce our Missouri Scholars. Thank you, thank you. I love these kind of board meetings where we're um, just recognizing all these wonderful children and, and all their accomplishments. Um, President Jacobs, there you are, right in the middle. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Senti and Mrs. Kalanda, I have great honor to be here tonight to recognize 11 sophomores from Parkway School District who have been named to the 2011 Missouri Scholars Academy. The Missouri Scholars Academy is a three-week acad academic program for approximately 330 of Missouri's gifted and talented students who are ready to begin their junior year of high school. The academy is a residential program held on the at the University of Missouri Columbia and a special selection committee appointed by the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education screens and evaluates all of the nominations. Participants are selected on the basis of some of the following criteria and factors. Students scores from individual intelligence and aptitude tests, their grade point averages, they have to write an extensive essay, and they have to have evidence of leadership, creativity, intellectual curiosity, problem-solving ability, and initiative. And those are just some of the characteristics they look for. And now I'd like to invite um, my colleagues, Jan Burroughs and Susan Dansdill, who are gifted high school facilitators who um, kind of took the charge in this process. And I'd also like to invite Mr. Lou Jobst, who um, is a veteran teacher of the Missouri Scholars Academy and also works with our high school gifted students. Because these individuals uh, put a lot of time and effort getting to know the students and helping them with their applications, I thought it would be best that they introduce the students and invite them to come up. So I will start with Jan. Oh, okay. Susan. Okay. As I announce the names of our scholars and they come forward with their parents, please stand. Parents, you play a very important role in the success of these students. The Central High students, uh, and also I'd like to thank the principals, Tim Gannon and Sarah Power, who have also supported our students. The first student from Central High, Hannah Weidner, would you please come forward and her parents stand? Joy Yang. From North High, I'd like to thank our principals, Jenny Marquardt and Keith Sanders, and also Melissa Pomerantz, who helped very much with the process. 
Would these students please come forward and would their parents stand? Christian Alton. Kenda Rowey. Benjamin Weinstock. And Christina Wesley. And once again, would the parents please stand as your students are recognized. These students are from South High. A special thank you goes to Gary Mazzola and Jim Gerker. Leela Chapman. Alicia Coronado. Christina Sitzer. And with a special thank you to principals Jeremy Mitchell and Beth Mittendorf, our students from West High School are Elizabeth Carroll, <laughs> who just returned from her soccer game, as you can tell. <laughs> and Jaron Ma. Thank you to all 11 of these students who've made it in the midst of testing and soccer games it's because of their dedication and their respect and their uh, appreciation to the Parkway School District. Uh, before Lou speaks, I'd like to again ask all of the parents of these students to stand up and let's give them all another round of applause. I just want to say very quickly, uh, my 27 years at the Scholars Academy uh, been teaching paradise, second only to the blessing of being able to teach in this school district for almost three decades. And I just met with Ted Tarko, who's the Assistant Dean of Arts and Sciences and the head of the Scholars Academy, and he wanted me to tell you all particular thanks to Dr. P P Papillo and the Parkway School District for paying for the $700 per student that is now required because of the lack of funding that the academy um, has uh, now realized. Um, and I'd also like to take this moment to thank you for the beauty of this moment of honoring these wonderful kids. Thank you. Well, we thank you too, and we believe in these uh, kids. So we're pleased that we have it in our budget that we can make this kind of uh, contribution to their education. They've earned it. We appreciate it very much. Thank you again. Next, we'd like to invite, uh, invite Wally Flick if he, uh, from the Parkway Alumni Association president, current president, if he would come to the podium to recognize the recipients of the Granting Dreams program. The Granting Dreams program, founded by the Alumni Association, is designed to turn dreams into realities for so many of our Parkway students who are eager to further their learning and explore new opportunities. Wally. Thank you, President Jacob and Board. The Parkway Alumni Association was founded in 1992 with the mission to encourage communication among alumni and to foster programs which serve and support the Parkway community. One of the first programs started to address this mission was Granting Dreams. As Mimi Holder, Chair of the Granting Dreams, puts it, when students meet success in one area of their lives, the thrill of accomplishment carries over into other areas and becomes a motivating factor in their education. 
Students need to dream and we need to listen to their dreams. The true success of the Granting Dreams program will be measured in years to come, years in which these grant recipients will realize their dreams. <clears throat> Part of that measure of success should probably include the fact that several of the Missouri scholars just announced are past and or current Granting Dreams recipients. As President Jacob noted, we will be awarding our Granting Dreams winners next week. Awards for 2011 will top the $21,000 mark distributed to more than 200 students. I guarantee you students and their supporting families will pack this room for an exciting evening as usual. Over its 15-year lifetime, Granting Dreams has awarded nearly $190,000 to over 2,100 K-12 Parkway students. Included in this total are what we call resource grants. A resource grant is when a student learns to request to learn directly from a community member or an alumni. Previous resource grants have included shadowing a teacher or a weather person. Dreams that have been granted have helped students realize their dreams in many areas, exploring robotics, chess, math, science, ice skating, space camp, swimming camp, art camps, music lessons, electronics, singing, writing, and aviation. This is very much a student-driven process where each student is, is responsible for filling out their own dream grant application. Many of our dream grants are funded through targeted funds set up by alumni or as memorials. For example, the Andrea Cohen Fund, a North 1976 grad, provides grants to students interested in fine arts and performing arts. Other memorial funds include the Kurt Shore Fund, Central 79 grad, Jason Johnson, North 89 grad, Christopher Reed, West 83 grad, Mark Morley, a Central 80 grad, Keith Koontz, a retired Parkway teacher, and Dr. John Baker, West High Band Director. Other dreams are funded through the General Granting Dreams Fund. As a shameless plug, anyone can contribute to this fund by visiting our website at parkwayalumni.org or by participating in one of our growing events, uh, our growing calendar of events. Your next opportunities are the golf tournament on June 10th and our uh, newest fundraiser, the John Baker Memorial Jazz Concert out at, by the barn at Lucerne, and it is on June 2nd. So as we wrap up the year, I uh, would like to uh, extend a personal thank you to President Jacob and the rest of the board for being uh, your continued support of our organization as we strive to uh, further the awesomeness of the Parkway School District. So thank you very much. Wally, we, we do thank you. We, uh, I've been to a couple of those uh, granting dreams. It's almost standing room only now. We're going to have to find a bigger venue. It's become so popular. We're very fortunate as a district to have a great alumni association that does so much for the district and for the, for the young people of the district. So thank you again. And thank you for your service. We know that there'll be a new president coming in and we really appreciate what you've done the last several years. We now want to uh, invite uh, our PNEA president, Joanda Bozeman, to the podium where she will introduce the students and recognize those winners of the Martin Luther King Jr. Essay Poster Contest. And we look forward to uh, those uh, presentations that will be made. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, President Jacob, Vice she, President She taught Thelma. my daughter in the fourth grade. No, no in, the, in the sixth grade. Not too long ago. <laughs> yeah, not too long ago. <laughs> Members of the board, Ms. Kalanda and Dr. Sinti, thank you for the opportunity to recognize our 2011 winners of the Martin Luther King Jr. Essay Poster Contest. This year's theme, Dream, Believe, Succeed, Keeping the Dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Alive. Dr. King was a man with a dream and he gave his life to make that dream come true for all. At 33, he was pressing the case of civil rights with President Kennedy. At 34, he galvanized the nation with his I Have a Dream speech. At 35, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. At 39, he was assassinated, but he left a legacy of hope and inspiration that continues today. 
At this time, I'd like to introduce Phyllis Calvin Barnes, who is a reading specialist at Mason Ridge and chair of the PNEA Human Rights Committee to present the awards to our students this evening. Phyllis. Thank you to Juwanda and the board and to the students and families that are here tonight. Um, boys and girls, just to remind you, when I call your name, will you go ahead and come stand up, okay? And come forward. Um, I would just like to take a minute to thank everyone who helped to make this event possible and give a warm welcome to all of our students and their guests. It is a fitting tribute to Dr. King's memory that even more than 40 years after his death, he is honored by events such as this contest. I'm thrilled to report that we had over 130 entries from almost 30 teachers and seven elementary schools this year. I truly appreciate the support of this wonderful opportunity for Parkway students. We are really pleased to be able to honor the students who created such inspirational words and images to support the theme, Dream, Believe, Succeed, keeping the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. alive. Some of our district winners were not able to attend this event due to school concerts and other scheduling conflicts, but for those of you who are here, please come forward as your name is called. Um, also, boys and girls, just so you know, after you get a chance to shake the board members' hands, would you please see the two ladies standing on the side there to actually get your uh, certificates and your gift cards, okay? Thank you. In first place in our kindergarten and first grade category, we have Tess Bacarie from Mason Ridge. In second place in our K-1 category is Patrick Johan from Oak Brook. <laughs> and I do apologize for the technical difficulties, but if you would look up on the screens, we now do have the students' posters and essays scrolling, so please enjoy them. In third place, from Oak Brook, we have Abby Burkhalter. Moving on to our second and third grade category, Alexis Nadro, a third grader from Mason Ridge. And in second place for the second and third grade category, Campbell Stewart from Mason Ridge. She's also a third grader. In third place in the second and third grade category, Adi Sarangi from Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> In 
In our fourth and fifth grade category, our first place winner is Jordan Shervitz from Shenandoah Valley. Our second place winner in the fourth and fifth grade category is John Ironman from Claymont. <laughs> For our third place winners in the fourth and fifth category, we have a tie. Harper Stewart from Mason Ridge is a fourth grader. <laughs> Unfortunately, Harper is one of the students who had another event at her school. She's at her um, concert tonight at Mason Ridge, but her sister informed us that she would be more than happy to accept the award in her honor. <laughs> and our other third place winner in uh, the fourth and fifth grade category is April Moon from Shenandoah Valley. Um, congratulations to all of our winners. I will let the parents come up and take pictures at this time. And while they're doing that, we have some additional special news. Once the uh, students' entries win at the district level, they move on to the state level of the competition. And we have the received the results from that competition as well. And we are so thrilled to announce that we have some state level of the competition winners among these students and they would be for the second place in the state of Missouri of the contest Tess Bacare from Parkway and Mason Ridge. <laughs> in second place in the second and third grade category at the state level Adi Sarangi. <laughs> In third place at the kindergarten and first grade level of the state competition, congratulations to Abby Burkhalter. <laughs> and in third place at the second and third grade level of the state competition, Campbell Stewart. <laughs> So again, congratulations to all of our district and state winners. Um, in addition, I would like to say a special thanks to Dr. Senti for his support of students and service to the district during his tenure, particularly during the last year, and we wish him all the best in his future endeavors. I would also like to thank our Parkway NEA members for their assistance with organizing the contest as well as serving as judges. As you may recall, we had several snow days earlier this school year. You remember those? And um, as a result of several events being rescheduled, it was very difficult to find people who were available to judge the students' entries. And so I would like to take a moment to give a special recognition to Brandy Brinker, a fifth grade teacher at Mason Ridge who took a tremendous amount of her time, two whole evenings, to help to organize and you know get these things judged. And really the whole staff at Mason Ridge pulled in at the last minute to help to support this, this effort. So I do appreciate that. And finally, I would like to thank our wonderful PNEA president, Joanda Bozeman, for her help with the contest as well as tonight's presentation. And thank you to Jill and Julie as well. Joanda's leadership and dedication is very much appreciated. Thank you all so much and have a good evening. A little bit more. Now we get to, to give away some money. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize our 2011 Parkway NEA scholarship recipients. 
Uh, the goal of our scholarship program is to, first of all, reaffirm the association's commitment to the community, to build support for public education, and to encourage talented students to enter the teaching profession, and also to increase opportunities for professional excellence. Since 1983, Parkway NEA has awarded scholarships to seniors wishing to enter the education profession. Traditionally, each of the five Parkway high schools has, given at least, has been given at least one scholarship. In 1988, an additional scholarship was added, the Gene Olson Memorial Scholarship. And for some of you who've been around a while, Gene Olson was a librarian at McKelvey School. And that scholarship goes to a child or dependent of a Parkway NEA member who is pursuing a career in education. In 1996, we added the Vito Maniachi Professional Development Scholarship for active Parkway NEA members. In 2002, the Linda Favero Memorial Scholarship was added to help provide professional development for teachers. And Linda Favero was a teacher at Mason Ridge School. So at this time, as I call your name, um, the high school scholarship winners, each of these students will receive a $500 scholarship from Parkway NEA. From Parkway South, we have Leah Marie Fender. Leah attended Oak Brook Elementary and Southwest Middle. She ranks in the top 6% of her class. Her volunteerism is just outstanding. One of her administrators wrote, one of Leah's greatest attributes lies neither in the classroom nor within extracurricular activity. It is her willingness to serve others. She has served as a teacher and mentor to children in St. Louis, Kentucky, and in Ghana. She has worked with Special Olympics and in area hospitals working with children of all ages and from all walks of life. Leah took a class last semester called Education and the Art of Teaching and set up a portfolio including her beliefs about teaching, the classroom tone that she would have, and the type of teacher she would strive to be. She spent six weeks student teaching in a third grade classroom and loved it. She would like to attend John Brown University where she would be able to do her internship in Ethiopia as an education major. She is interested in early childhood education and would like to get extra certification in ESL and in grades 5-6. Congratulations, Leah. Our next recipient is also a senior at Parkway South, Nicole Groves. Uh, Nicole could not be with us this evening because of uh, other activities that she was involved in. But she plans to um, pursue a career as a high school English teacher. Our next recipient receiving the Jean Olson Memorial Scholarship is Ann Elizabeth Holzen. Anne is the daughter of Paul Hosen, who is the band teacher at Central Middle. Anne is a senior at Fort Zumwalt West High School, where she has participated and been a leader in many activities and received honors as well. One of her teachers wrote, Annie's originality in her creative life, be it in her theater work, her musical career, or her creative writing, is truly one of her strongest traits. She possesses the ability to find orig originality in the smallest of assignments, and she approaches this work with sparks of enthusiasm, passion, and an open mind. Annie will attend Southe Southeast Missouri State University, where she plans to excel as an English education major and theater minor and return home to teach students to love English class the way she has. Receiving the $500 Linda Favero Memorial Scholarship is teacher Matt Alonzo. Matt is a math teacher at Parkway North High School. This is his eighth year in Parkway. 
Matt uses various technologies in his classroom. He's spoken at two international conferences about the use of technology in the classroom. And his goal is to obtain a Master's of Science in Educational Technology from the University of Central Missouri. Congratulations, Matt. And receiving the $500 Vito Maniachi Professional Development Scholarship is Annette McConnell, Spanish teacher at Northeast Middle, nine years in education and her sixth year in Parkway. Annette plans to take a continuing education graduate course entitled Teacher Leadership for Learning and Teaching. Her hope is to become a more effective leader of student learning and to gain insight into current learning research and its impact on teaching practice. This course evaluates roadblocks to learning and how to overcome them. It implements the four models of effective instruction, mastery, understanding, self-expression, and interpersonal. Receiving the $250 Vito Maniachi Scholarship is Laura Bowles, a social studies teacher at West High for the past eight years. Laura plans to take a course on differentiated instruction for student success, which examines student differences, learn how and when to differentiate instruction. She plans to use her new skills in her co-taught and honors classes. Also receiving the $250 Vito Maniachi Scholarship is Donna Volk, itinerant ESOL teacher serving kindergartners and first graders at Sorrento Springs, Wren Hollow, and Oak Brook. She's a traveling teacher. <laughs> She's been in education for 15 years, 10 years in Parkway. She prides herself on being a resource for culturally responsive teaching and will take a graduate class called Meeting the Needs of Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. This course will address the potential cultural and linguistic barriers to learning, examine the connection between culture and learning, and support students' cultural differences and create an equitable learning experience for all students. Could we at this time have another round of applause for all of our recipients this evening? And thank you again for giving us the opportunity to share these accomplishments. President Bozeman and Phyllis, we thank you so much for these presentations, for introducing these wonderful students and teachers to us. We're particularly proud of their accomplishments and they're all winners and we thank you very much. I don't know if you realize this, but Tess is going to be a graduate of the uh, 2022 class. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you again. And uh, families of the winners, I know that some of you may need to get going because you have younger children, so feel free to excuse yourselves at this time if you need to. Thank you again to the board. Ann Geller, executive board member of the St. Louis Suburban Music Educators Association, who will make a presentation for, for that uh, person who's uh, being recognized tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ann Geiler, and I'm past president of the St. Louis Suburban Music Educators. It is my honor to be here tonight to present an award to Paul Holson, band director at Parkway Central Middle School. Throughout his over 20 years of teaching, Paul has proven himself as a dedicated musical professional. 
He is enthusiastic and works to give his students the best musical experiences possible. He has built a successful band program at Parkway Northeast Middle School and now is building a program at Parkway Central Middle School. Mr. Holden's energy and passion for teaching show through every day when he is in the classroom, challenging his students to do their personal best every day, as well as challenging them as an ensemble as he participates in large ensemble festival and solo and small ensemble festival. Paul's commitment to music education also shows with his willingness to mentor young teachers. He has also been the guest conductor of two middle school honors jazz bands this year in the state of Missouri. Paul has served on the board of the St. Louis Suburban Music Educators as middle school band vice president and webmaster. Paul is an excellent role model for his students. As well as being a top-notch music educator, Paul is also the member of the Air National Guard. He plays in two of the St. Louis Area Guard bands, showing his student that he too has to sometimes listen to somebody tell them how the music sounds. I think it's always good for us to look at that, you know, <laughs> sit in a group and have somebody tell us and conduct us. His students are well aware of this, as many times Paul is called to serve his country and must be away from the classroom. He is sometimes called for musical things and other times for to, to help with community disasters like the recent tornado damage in St. Louis. I am proud to call Paul a colleague. Paul is an excellent example of, of an ex I can't even say the word now <laughs> of a great music teacher, and I am proud to present. And I hope he can come up now. <laughs> so I would like to present Paul with the St. Louis Suburban Certificate of Merit Award for his contributions to music education. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ann. We appreciate that. We appreciate all of these recognitions tonight. We were honored to have you with us, and at this time, we'll take a brief break, break and we'll resume the board meeting shortly. Thank you. We appreciate that, and it was wonderful to have those kinds of presentations. Uh, I know as a board, we, I think, uh, Tess stole our hearts. <laughs> uh, 4.0, additions, corrections, and modifications to agenda. I have none. So I would like to do one thing before I go any further in the agenda. I'd like to recognize the Boy Scouts that are here tonight. Uh, which troop is it that we have here? Do we have a spokesman, a senior patrol leader, or? 492, will we welcome you here? Are you here working on one of your merit badges? Citizenship or the communications? Great, well, hopefully it won't be too lively tonight. <laughs> Citizen statements, there are none. 6.0, uh, call for a closed session, none. 7.0, approval of agenda for May 4th, 2011. I'd like to uh, ask for a motion and a second that we approve the agenda for May 4th, 2011. Coming. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries 7-0. And uh, 8.0, resolutions. We, uh, National School Nurses Day, May 11th, and Memorial Day, May 30th, 2011. I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to accept those resolutions. All in favor? So moved. I'm sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? The motion carries 7 0. 9.0 communications, 9.02 calendar of meetings. A special meeting of the Board of Education is scheduled for Friday and Saturday, June 3rd and 4th at the Administration Building. And the next regular meeting 
of the Board of Education is scheduled for Wednesday, June 15, 2011, here at Central Middle School starting at 7.30 p.m. 9.03, Liaison Reports. Is there anyone that has some liaison reports? We'll start with Mr. Majors. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, last Thursday, I had the uh, honor of attending the uh, Commitment to Kids Banquet, which is the uh, SSD uh, recognition night. And uh, if you haven't been to one, I, I highly recommend it. Uh, you, you, can't, uh, you can't spend the evening there and not be uh, profoundly moved. So uh, just some, some wonderful accomplishments and achievements by those young people. And I uh, wanted to mention particularly uh, there were numerous uh, Parkway recognitions and uh, specifically Jennifer Scanlon uh, came home with the uh, four separate scholarships that evening. So she was the uh, clear winner <laughs> in the individual category. So uh, certainly congratulate her. Uh, and then uh, this afternoon had the, the somber duty of uh, going down to Afton, uh, cutest funeral home there for uh, Mark Wade, uh, South High math teacher and uh, my oldest daughter's freshman math teacher. Uh, wonderful man and uh, just an incredible loss for South. Our, uh, our hearts are with them this week. Thank you, Bruce. Mr. Applebaum? Well, uh, I, I, I can report that I, I've been by Parkway North, and I was afraid that instead of a football field, they're going to have a reflecting pool. <laughs> but, <laughs> but things are progressing on that front, and I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Uh, Sunday, I uh, attended the uh, Parkway uh, Art Show at, at uh, Queenie. And um, as I was walking through, it, of course, reminded me of the um, art projects that my sons did when uh, they went through Parkway. Um, and also, <coughs> picking up one of the booklets, I have <coughs> here, <coughs> excuse me, six pages. We're talking about scholarships and awards and recognitions. There's six pages here of students, Parkway students, who uh, received uh, numerous awards, scholarships, and recognitions, and that's a testament to all the talented students that we have here in Parkway. The, uh, amounts, uh, different amounts, uh, I want to say amounts, the different types of media, uh, pastel drawings, pencils, uh, ceramics, uh, uh, clay, um, uh, just, uh, and, and photography. It was just uh, a wonderful, wonderful program. And I would like to thank uh, Sandy Collins and her fine arts department and all the instructors. Uh, and especially for the time that they take to set up, it's not something where you just, you know, put the pictures up. I, that, that I'm sure takes hours to uh, do the setup and then the takedown. So kudos to the teachers uh, for their time and effort also. Uh, many proud parents taking pictures. Uh, it reminded me of when I did the same thing years ago. Uh, and uh, it was it's just a wonderful experience to see the uh, talent that we have here in Parkway. So uh, students, uh, much, much appreciation for your talent here. Thank you very much. Sam? Um, I attended the uh, Parkway Retirees uh, Scholarship Luncheon this past week, and uh, it was a wonderful event to see old friends and uh, old retirees, <laughs> those of us who are old retirees, but um, they offer a scholarship each year, $3,000 uh, for a future teacher, and uh, they're both the two young women who receive the scholarships, one from the Retirement Association, the other from the Joyce Sorrento uh, Scholarship, which is uh, in honor of Joyce, who was a longtime wonderful teacher at Parkway, and it's uh, dedicated to her by her daughters. And Leah, who was here this evening, uh, was a recipient of that particular scholarship. Wow. So it's really great uh, to hear the scholarship offerings uh, from the various associations that give these young people an opportunity, a head start in their college life, and uh, helping to fund some of that as well. I think we're to you, Helen. Yeah. I'm talking to I have a whole list, and I want everybody to know I'm not texting during the meeting. I'm in the 21st century. I put it all on my phone. <laughs> Let's hope it works. <laughs> um, 
the most recent thing was uh, yesterday, Helen and Chris and I went to the Character Education Plus presentation at Ross Elementary. I see Bonnie Maxie back there with a big smile on her face. It was a wonderful ceremony honoring the kids at Ross who have become a, a, character, a school of character. And this is a great honor. There are 76 schools of character throughout the United States. That's out of 132,000 schools. And here in the state of Missouri, there were 10 new schools of character this year out of the 3,000 schools in Missouri. So that's quite a feat. Lisa Greenstein has really put her heart and soul into the program, and the kids were amazing. They were singing, and they, they were really feeling it. And there were two girls there, uh, fourth, fourth graders? That were Mackenzie and uh, Megan. Megan, and they were disturbed by the um, by their neighbors in Pattonville by their loss from the recent hurricane. And these girls started up uh, hurricane. I'm from Florida. Tornado. <laughs> they <laughs> these girls started on their own a uh, program to to collect funds to give to a, a group in Pattonville that's going to make sure that the money gets to the people who need it, whose homes were damaged in the recent storms. And uh, you know, if we grow them from fourth grade as fundraisers and community volunteers, what great assets they'll be to our community when they get a little older. So that was really rewarding. Um, last night I attended the PCH, I saw Sandy there, the choir concert, last one of the year, it was really great, it was wonderful and fun. And I also went to uh, my first time at the Digital Film Festival. And um, in spite of it being a cold and rainy night, there were lots of people there and some really, really proud filmmakers. And I loved watching the kids walk the red carpet. They were just so proud. And it's just so neat to see kids get recognition for these talents that they have. It's you know just beyond the normal ABCs that they get recognition for on a daily basis. And the most wonderful thing I learned about the Digital Film Festival is that it doesn't cost Parkway at all. That everything is donated. I think um, Purser, I think Logan don donates the space, and it was held at the Purser Center at Logan College. And they have several sponsors that um, contribute towards it, and it was a really worthwhile event. I encourage everybody who's never been to go next year. Thank you, mm -hmm. Beth. <laughs> um, I don't know if you mentioned it, but uh, Ross is the first Parkway school to get this. Uh, so we hope that they'll, they'll get to wear this banner for three years, and hopefully they'll try to obtain it again, and they'll have some company, we hope, by that time uh, among some of the other Parkway schools. schools working on it. I think there are a couple of schools working on it, correct? Okay. Is there anything else anybody would like to report? Appreciate your support of uh, activities and things that happen in the district. We did have a wonderful time uh, Monday evening to the Alumni Association Appreciation Dinner. Uh, a good time was had. Our MCs were phenomenal. They were okay. <laughs> <laughs> Food was good. Food was very good, and I think it was a larger crowd than than we've had. Uh, although they've always been well attended, but 53 retirees and then a slew of uh, other recognitions. It was just uh, made you proud to be part of Parkway. And it doesn't mean we're perfect, but there's an awful lot of good people trying very hard to do the right things. We appreciate it. Moving on, uh, 10.0 action items. Um, I'd like to ask for a Motion and a second to approve these consent items, uh, 10.01 through 10.44. So moved. Second. Thank you. Are there any questions or any items that should be pulled for action or other consideration? Closed. Uh, Mr. Jacob, I'd like to pull 10.29, the approval of the purchase of fitness equipment to action. All right. 10.29 will be pulled. For Anything else? Uh, any questions or any others that need to be pulled for? All right, then uh, I'd ask for a uh, that we go ahead and uh, approve uh, all of those 10.01 through 10.44, with the exception of 10.29. All in favor? Moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? They passed 7 0. And let's talk a little bit about 10.29. I'm Ron Ramspot. I'm the coordinator of health and physical education. I was the one who initially um, moved forward the request for fitness equipment. Okay. Go ahead, Helen. Fit. 
she even had um, a name tag on. <laughs> Ron, you and I have spoken about this before. My concern was that um, some of the schools have really wonderful spaces to put their fitness equipment and some of the schools like the one where we are tonight have no space. And uh, Parkway Central Middle lost its third gym about five years ago. It was taken down under emergency situation when the building wasn't safe. And um, there's just a dirt patch back there right now and nothing's ever been done about it. And I think with the um, everyday PE, and the wonderful fitness program that you're trying to put in and that we have all these great teachers hired to put in. I think the kids at this school are really suffering due to the loss of that third gym. So that's what I wanted to talk about tonight. Beth, um, thank you for um, mentioning that. Um, it is unfortunate that Central Middle lost the gymnasium what, four or five years ago. Um, and since then, they've been dealing with two indoor instructional spaces, basically and a small um, stage area, which is about um, 15 by 35, approximately, um, which can barely accommodate um, half a class. That's currently serving as their fitness center. So I, um, they invited me <laughs> this past winter to come up and experience physical education in their environment. And I, I spent several days up there. And um, they, they seemed very frustrated. Um, the students are leaving books and bags and, in the hallway so that they don't have to clutter up the gym and there's just not a lot of room to move. Um, and in fact, um, I did some estimates on the square footage. Um, with those three spaces and if we include the stage area, which really um, we probably shouldn't, um, the square footage is just over 11,000. And that's approximately, uh, according to their enrollment of 882, um, it's about 12 square foot per person, okay, per student. Um, if you think of that 11,000 square feet um, and compare that to um, a school in similar size, West Middle, which has um, 60 fewer students, they have 8,700 8, more um, square footage in physical education um, space, instructional space, than Central Middle does. Basically, when you look at the number of classes that Central Middle is trying to squeeze into those spaces, it's um, less than, um, per class, it's less than our smallest gyms. We're trying to put one class into an area of approximately um, 2,000 feet, um, 2,000 square feet. So. Um, it is unfortunate. Um, I know that um, um, Mr. Mike Bogus and Mr. Um, Greg Bergner and I have um, spoken many a times um, about what to do and we're not sure um, what can be done. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. um, and this, bear with me here, and Don, you might remember this, but when Bell Reeve was opened, and for many years, and maybe you remember this, Sam, Bell Reeve had a temporary space that was used as a gym. It was, I believe, a concrete slab. Do we have a concrete slab out there or no? No, I think it's gravel. I think it's rock. Is it gravel? Yeah. And it was like a tent thing, yeah. wasn't it? And they used it for years until they could build a gym. I don't know if that's something anyone's looked into or talked about or is it even, even possible, but. The science center is downtown. Yes. And maybe it still does. I think they do. I think it's still there. And we could look into that as a solution. I'm, I'm sort of wondering why why we're in the situation in the first place. Um, because it was an emergency. The build. The the four, four years ago. Five, five. years ago. Yeah. The. Uh, oh well. But the fitness center's been there longer than that. Well, I, but I the third gym know. was. Poorly constructed. Poorly constructed and at risk of falling in on our well, students, and right, we had so to. Was the fitness center in there at the time? I don't know no, it wasn't. At that time, we did out. not have a fitness <laughs> center. For you were here. Yep. 15, 20 years. But I think we all need to remember that we have everyday PE now in middle school, which we didn't have up until this year. So it's, it's double the amount of students that are using those gyms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the third gym was, was taken down in emergency status because we, when, when we went in to do some work on the gym, we found that it was not constructed properly back in 1974, 1975. The cracks in the walls were such that a uh, tornado or high wind would have pushed those walls in on the gym. Uh, it was condemned 
and we took it down in emergency status. The decision that 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 put this school here, uh, when, when you have the five middle schools, it was then third, had the third amount of space out of five schools for square footage for gyms. Several schools have two gyms, uh, very few had three. And so the decision at that time was made, because we, we were coming out of that bond issue going into another, um, uh, the district decided that we're not including adding this gym into the 2008 bond issue. and. Uh, and we're going to look at it at a future bond issue. That was uh, Dr. Molita's decision okay. at the time. So, so that's the background on the third gym here. But I, I think, Mike, that, that the schools don't necessarily put their fitness, their strength, and their uh, um, aerobic equipment in a gym, per se. Like at West Middle, there's that whole other space that's not a gym. I don't know what you call it. It's the fitness center. Right. But it's not a gym. Right. So if you would count that as a gym, then, you know, that's another gym. Oh, I'm, no, I'm, and I'm not already in you know, but they came up with that space. That's one of the things that you're going to find. Each school has come up with their space. We didn't come up and say, okay, we're going to take the space from you, Westminster, right. and make a, right. a fitness area. This is the school, Linda, and then the folks that came up with that space and turned it into a, a fitness area. But, but no, I didn't, we are, we've, we've had this discussion ourselves, and we understand the, the situation. So it's a situation that I would think would come back to Soup's Council as to, you know, is this a priority and fund, and then how about designing something to to uh, meet the needs of, of this particular situation? If anything, could there be a portable building? Is there a portable building available? At, like in Barrett's, uh, that one of those buildings? Uh, uh, we can always. We should be able to come up with something temporary for the school. Yeah, we, we can always come up with something temporary uh, once we have really understand the needs of the space they need, the the height they need, and then uh, and come up with a temporary solution. Would a temporary solution would that be bond issue money? Mm -hmm. It would. Yeah, the the number of dollars you're talking about, it would have to come out of bond issue some other fund. So what do we, what don't we do to fund this? Is the question. <laughs> In the meantime, Ron, um, is there a plan to put the six additional? <coughs> I imagine every school is getting six pieces if they're... It's approximately pieces. six, okay. and, so and they put in that request. Do we know uh, if they have a place to put these six pieces of equipment here it, in the school? It's my understanding, um, because I, I pretty much um, allowed the department and the principals to decide how much equipment they could afford mm -hmm. um, to you know, be accommodated in their fitness center. They brought the request to me. Um, so it's my understanding that the health and PE department, along with the school administrators, are working together to find space so that they can use it right away. Now that may mean putting it in a hallway, <laughs> which isn't ideal. Um, and maybe some space, a classroom opens up, um, nothing as of yet, but um, they're hopeful to um, get that in place right away for kids to use. I just, I worry a little bit about the safety. I toured the school with Dr. Marty few months ago when he was here and we went in there was a class in session in there and there's no room to walk you know their cords all over and they're they're taped to the floor but it's very easy for kids to trip and I just think that we need to make a safe comfortable place for these kids to take advantage of this equipment it's not ideal at all and, and not just the fitness center but the gymnasium right. I mean there's not a lot of room to move so really the scope of the curriculum and the um, the um, Experience the learning experiences of our students are um, not what they should be, and safety is being jeopardized. Um, when you look up in that space, if you get a chance to go up on the stage area, the equipment is right next to each other. I mean, it's almost touching each other, and there should be a three-foot clearance in between each piece of equipment. So really, it is um, a safety hazard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the board on the... Uh, is there anyone, uh, when these students are in the fitness areas, is, uh, is there an instructor there or somebody there at all times? There is. Um, and um, the, they have a section of the um, divider that divides the stage area from the gym that's um, open. And the, um, sometimes they do rotate students up to the fitness center as a station because they really can't put a full class up there. Um, so the, the teacher will stand kind of in that doorway. Once again, it limits their effectiveness to go around and 
work one on one with kids and, and give feedback, that's where that learning experience I think is diminished because they're they're always trying to position themselves in a, a good place to supervise all the students. Okay, well thank you, uh, Beth, for bringing that more to light. I think most of us have been back there to see the what's on the gym, on the uh, stage there, and it's not the best situation. Dr. Sandy, did you have a comment? Uh, well, We'll talk about this in the council. I, I, I need to understand when we planned the last bond issue, and there must have been a prioritization process, and I'm just surprised this wasn't in it. So, yeah. but we will uh, we'll talk about it. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. That being said, do we have a motion and a second to approve uh, 10.29 approval of purchase of fitness equipment machines? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes 7-0. Uh, 11-0 action items. 11.01 Project Parkway approval of the 2011-2016 CSIP. I'd like to call on Dr. Tim Hudson who was here in front. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Coordinator of our mathematics and our Project Parkway steering committee facilitator. Good evening. Thank you, uh, President Jacob, Vice President Feldman, members of the board, Ms. Kalanda, Dr. Senti. That's a pretty exciting night, and I'm leading off a whole lot of great presentations. So uh, we'll get started. The uh, 2011 to 2016 strategic plan is, uh, is what we're here about tonight. The key questions that we've been working with through Project Parkway from Grant Wiggins are how will we know when we can say mission accomplished and how will our district goals and strategic plan accomplish our mission in the next five years? This quote I have shared several times. The first job of leaders in a nonprofit institution is to turn the organization's mission statement into specifics. And that's exactly what we've tried to do. If you recall when this whole thing started, I don't know exactly who said it, but uh, this is going to be messy was kind of how we started. That might have been the first steering committee meeting, uh, if I recall. So we knew up front. But here's the great thing. We've, uh, we've cleaned it up. It looks, looks a lot cleaner. Uh, in the limited time that I have this evening, we'll be talking mostly about the mission goals on the left, the purpose, uh, the purpose goals. But it's, of course, applicable to the blue part on the right. We did some color coding. Uh, and I really want to make sure that there's, uh, there's good understanding on the part of everyone about what the plan looks like as it currently stands. So tonight, uh, as I had sent in the memo and the update, we're seeking approval as written of the six goals and the 19 measurable objectives. So uh, from these two documents, the six goals are the six boxes, and then all of the bullets underneath them are the measurable objectives, what we would like to accomplish by 2016. And then seeking approval sort of in spirit of the strategies and action steps. That was the 20 pages of um, additional information that uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more as we go through about those. But that's, that's what we're looking for tonight. The key points that uh, by proving these, we'd be saying these are the goals for Parkway, our direction for the next five years, uh, sort, of, sort of at all levels. This is, these are the goals for Parkway. The steering committee has led the development of these goals and objectives to get us to mission. Uh, the strategies, the action steps, the persons responsible, the timelines, those are all still under development, a little more fluid, and we've already been in conversations uh, with Dr. Marty about how we prioritize and move forward with those. At this point, uh, getting our direction is, is really the key piece that, uh, the steering committee, as the word steering means, heading us in the right direction and looking at these goals sort of as road signs, mile markers, as we're getting closer and closer to accomplishing our mission. So we've decided what's most important, and this is the question, now how do we get there? Uh, and before I get too much further, I want to stop and, and do a little celebration. You know, we've had two years of community engagement. We've kind of working with a new draft of the house where you can see Project Parkway on one side of the roof, the commitments on the other, uh, just a little bit of a change from what Schooling by Design had, progress monitoring. But I want to I acknowledge uh, anyone who's here that's a member of the steering committee. I want to thank you for your hard work. Stand up if you're a steering committee member that's here. And 
And then anyone else out there who's done work with Project Parkway, go ahead and I'll, anyone who's done anything with Project Parkway in the past two years, if you don't stand up, I'm going to figure out <laughs> how that was managed. But anyway, what's that? Oh, I'm already standing. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, here we go. What, what's different now that we've done this work? What is the value added by a Parkway education? Uh, for our, our, our six, uh, for our six goals, the three mission ones, I, I kind of created this graphic to kind of help out uh, that we have the capable, curious, and confident learners. And in the strategic plan, we've broken it down uh, in this way, that for the capable learner goal, there are really five measurable objectives. We have goals related to our curriculum, the state audit, what, what the MAP and the EOC, what, what that's, uh, what's required of us there, the ACT performance, the AP performance, and then some goals related to graduates and their outcomes. Then in the, in the documents that you got, that's our current draft, uh, there are 20 pages that look very much like this. This one in particular is about our curriculum, and we have strategies, a guaranteed relevant challenging curriculum, all the way down to action steps like improve the kindergarten curriculum. And there are so many sub-steps even below that that uh, it's part of the reason I'm using this particular program to realize there's higher levels of the plan and then we can zoom down and zoom down even further than this. And tonight, what we're looking for is that, that high view, those six goals and 19 measurable objectives so that we can then decide which of all of these great ideas and actions that we could take are going to get us there. We've got the curious learning goal where we have two measurable objectives there, local and global problem solving, creativity, and divergent thinking. And this is one of the places where uh, I don't think you're going to find goals like this in most districts right now. Part of our mission being curiosity, as we've, if we've looked into it, um, creativity is a key piece of that, and we'll talk a little bit more. Um, we have some strategies and action steps about how to get there, get, get kids thinking divergently and creatively. And I thought I'd take a, a bit of a of a sidestep real quick to just talk a little bit about this one piece of divergent thinking since we're asking you to approve some bullets and want to make sure you have a little bit of understanding on that one. I know that in the steering committee we talked about it a bit. Um, but if this question is on your mind, then you are curious, right? What, what is that? Yeah, we know what curiosity looks like. Uh, and in my research, I came across a book called Game Storming, which is kind of like a 21st century brainstorming kind of thing. And they had this graphic that talked about uh, when you are solving some sort of problem or, or thinking through a process, you've got three, three phases. You start thinking divergently. What are all the possibilities? Then you spend some time thinking emergently where you're exploring, you're trying to make sense, but ultimately you're trying to, to close, you're trying to converge on a solution. And there's a lot of different uh, analogies to help understand this. Um, one of the ones I like is uh, Apollo 13. Houston, we have a problem, and we know what the solution is, getting the astronauts back safely. So they had to go, and y'all seen the movie? Yes? So they had to go in the room and basically think, what on earth can we do? Well, not even on earth. What in space can we do <laughs> with all of these things? Uh, and they had to wrestle through it to finally converge on a solution that would get the astronauts back home. This is the process that we used uh, on the steering committee to come up with mission. We spent a whole lot of time here, and it kind of got uncomfortable at points. And then we spent a whole lot of time here, seven drafts worth of emergent exploring to finally converge on our mission and vision. Uh, you might even say our vision bullet. We have some creative, thoughtful, and effective problem solving. It's really not effective problem solving if you don't converge on a solution, right? Uh, do I have any other examples? Oh, this program I'm using for the presentation. At some point, somebody got bored with PowerPoint, and they said, is there another way that we could do this? So uh, we now have this free software. Um, does that make a little sense? Good. I like nods. Um, I also found, I won't spend much time on this, that our learning principles kind of fall into categories like this. When we're asking kids to take intellectual risks, there's a bit of divergence there and some meaning making here, but I won't linger on that. We can talk more about that later after everyone's done tonight. Have a learning principle session at the end. Looking forward. Sound good, everybody? <laughs> yes? Okay. And, uh, and here's part of the reason why we, we, we have these measurable objectives and the curiosity goal from schooling by design, unless we assess for mission-based goals. Uh, things aren't going to change much in the way we need them to change to accomplish our mission. So we're going to have to design some local assessments that measure what matters most. I know that's a slide I've shared uh, several times. 
And that's, uh, that's a really key piece. So confident learners. Uh, here we have three goals. We want our students to be self-directed, persistent, physically and emotionally safe. Uh, we want them to monitor their personal goals. And we have, you know, a lot of steps in here. One of the strategies we have, uh, of, we have about six main strategies for our student goals, is enhance student input. We need to hear more of our students' voices. And that's something that's come through from Project Parkway uh, from the beginning. We always love to hear what our students have to say. And they, they left. I was going to, okay. <laughs> the Boy Scouts are gone. <laughs> now, there are things that we can do. They converged. <laughs> they, they converged on the door. That's right. Uh, is that when they left, when I was doing that slide? No. Um, so we also have some actions and some steps that we can take that are really going to address all three of these. It's not that everything can be compartmentalized. So that's uh, the question we had there. You know, what action steps need to be taken related to assessment, for example? What do we need to be doing with our assessments here in Parkway to really accomplish all of these goals? And those are the green pages, the three green pages uh, that are in the, uh, the current draft of the strategic plan. These are things that are going to have an impact across all of our 10 student measurable objectives. And one of the strategies there is ensure ongoing professional development, which also happens to be a strategy for uh, some of the blue pages, uh, our blue goals related to our adults, that, uh, that our professional development is effective, that um, all of our staff, faculty, teachers, administrators are improving, are getting better. We are accomplishing our mission. So there's a nice, uh, a nice connection between, there's a lot of crossovers between this work. And that's part of the hard work. It is a complex thing we're trying to, trying to do. In, uh, as we were finalizing this work, uh, Becky Langrell shared this book, uh, she's our ComArts coordinator, shared this book with me, The Fourth Way, by some educational researchers and leaders, Andy Hargreaves and Dennis Shirley. And I believe she and Julie Collins had gone to a systems thinking workshop. And uh, I basically, she shared with me some tables and charts in it that I want to share with you tonight uh, as validation of the work we're doing. They wrote this in 2009, right as we were getting started. And they call it The Fourth Way because in the history of education, there have apparently been multiple ways. Um, <laughs> there are dates associated with these first ways, this interregnum, which I took Latin, I, it means something between the king, I think. But uh, second way, there are these different ways, and you know, this might have been 100 years ago, 50 years ago. There's, there's phases that education has gone through. And what was nice is you know, looking at curriculum, purpose, targets, teaching and learning, learning community, that. Uh, Originally, there was inconsistent innovation. Uh, the targets were local and sampled. Teaching and learning was eclectic and uneven. Public and community was mainly absent. There was lacking public engagement. Then it moved into parent communication. There were some collaborative cultures, um, broad standards and outcomes. Moving on to this next phase, there was some standardization, some prescription, uh, high stakes targets, and actually that's kind of where we're at right now. That kind of started in the mid 80s. Direct instruction to the standards, contrived collegiality, parent choice, these became some of the things. Well, the third way moved to arbitrary imposed escalating targets, reward and performance driven teaching and learning. Uh, data-driven, delivery of services to the community. So you can see this shift, and they actually threw in goals and students here that weren't there before. And here's really, here's really the key piece. When you look at what we've accomplished in Project Parkway, uh, here is the fourth way, solutions, that the goals are no longer competitive, competitive measurable standards. They're inspiring. They're innovative. They're inclusive of mission. Our students, we're, we're engaging them and giving them voice. Our targets aren't arbitrary. They're ambitious. They're shared. Teaching and learning is mission and conditions driven. The learning community is evidence informed and the public and community, it's not just about delivery of services, it's about public engagement and development. And when I read this column, and there are more descriptors, I thought this is exactly what we've done and uh, I really truly believe we are leading the way as a result. So here's our house and I threw in here, this is another way to think about our strategic plan. <laughs> a lot of arrows there. They, w they should be like hooks, because where does everything hook? We want everything to be coherent working in the system. So you can see here that in our 2011-16 plan, goals one, two, and three, all about the mission and vision. Goals four and five are about personnel, 
evaluation, professional collaboration and development. Goal six is about uh, allocating resources. And then all of our strategies also fit here within the top of the house. And actually, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, our agenda item, the very next one, that lives on the top of the house. I believe that's going to be, uh, Paul, are you next? All right, so that's there. Uh, agenda item 12.01, that's also here. 12.02, I believe uh, some of our teacher evaluation pieces, those live here. Everything is coherent and working together uh, rather than in isolation, which I think is pretty cool, uh, including the green arrows. Oh, that's a, okay. <laughs> anyway, another quote. When we talk about our strategic plan, greatness is not a function of circumstance. It's largely a matter of conscious choice and discipline. And that's what our plan is all about. We've made conscious choices, and now we just need to have the discipline to see them through. We've, we've discussed that we're not focusing too much on the means. We're focusing on the destination, which is improved learning, which is why we made the distinction. We have to have outcomes for our kids, first and foremost, but we also have obligations in our community. So I have a video now, a very short three-minute uh, video from Dr. Grant Wiggins, who, uh, since he started the work with us, we invited him to give us a little video um, closing his work with us. Hello to my good friends in the Parkway School District. It's Grant Wiggins from New Jersey. I wanted to take this opportunity to say how delighted I was to work with Parkway over the last three years and give a special thanks to the school board for supporting the Parkway project and a special thank you to the leadership of the Parkway Project. You know, when we started this project a few years ago, I remember the conversation we had when I first visited, and there was all sorts of head shaking and naysaying about uh, the possibility of getting people to agree to agree about curriculum, about program goal statements and the like. And here we are a few years later, and it's not only happened, but you've done it in a way that is exemplary, uh, a model for what other districts can do. All this without sacrificing uh, the long tradition at Parkway and the personalized approach school by school. And that's really the vision of Schooling by Design, uh, the work that we've been involved in together. It's uh, standards without standardization. It's clarity of outcomes and expectations and a seamlessness and an alignment that enables the client, the student, and the student's parents to have confidence that if they have to change schools or move into a new neighborhood in the district, uh, that they can count on a curriculum, an assessment framework, an approach to outcomes and grading that is consistent across the district all the while without sacrificing uh, teacher freedom, uh, innovation, and uh, the kind of personalized approach to education that we know is the only way to go. So I wish you all well. I'm delighted to have worked with you, and I stand ready to be of assistance in the future. But from the way things are going, I, I don't think you'll be needing our services. Um, it seems, especially in light of the fact that we've now seen a few changes of administration without losing the thread of mission-based learning, that something rare is occurring in Parkway, and that's the uh, institutionalization of a set of beliefs and outcomes that are now uh, stronger than any individuals who hold the chairs of leadership. Uh, and that's the kind of stability and coherence uh, that is a model for other systems. So well done and good fortune. So I'd like to conclude with uh, two final pieces. Uh, one in my studies about the creativity piece. Uh, you know, we, we found you know, this question, what's different? What's the value added by a Parkway education? And we do have, um, I believe, one of the best, if not the best, um, mission, missions of any educational institution 
in getting feedback, I'm going to skip through a couple of these. We, you know, one of the biggest concerns we, we got in the feedback uh, on the strategic plan and on the goals is that concern about all, which came up a little bit when we were developing the mission as well. And the steering committee was very committed to keeping all in all of our goals for all students, uh, which was, you know, an amazing point of solidarity, which is, is exactly how we have to go, I believe. And, and one of the comments, you know, a few folks said, how can we really expect all students to be divergent, creative thinkers? And uh, this is also from that, uh, the book, the game storming book I referenced. It's easy to leave creativity to the creative types and say to yourself, I'm just not a creative person. The fact is that in a complex, dynamic, competitive knowledge economy, it's no longer acceptable to take this position. If you are a knowledge worker, you must become to some degree creative. And so I do believe we have a, a mission that is forward thinking to serve our students well uh, in the 21st century with their note taking phones. <laughs> Last piece, in whenever you talk about mission and you talk about an, uh, analogies, you have of course the military analogy. So I've been doing a little research on the military, have never been a part of it myself, but I did check this with Paul Tandy. Paul, is this correct? So our strategic plan is our way to prove our mettle, which I just learned is the mission essential task list. Is that correct? All right, this is, what, this is what it's about. What is mission essential? And uh, a couple of additional quotes. We have a concept of operations, I believe is a military term. All right, the con ops. And this describes our work excellently. Uh, our goal is to create an overall picture of the system and communicate that picture to the people who will work together to reach those goals. It's a way to say here at the bottom, given what we know today, here is how we think this system works and here is how we plan to approach it. That is what our strategic plan is all about in an ever-changing world. It's under constant revision and adjustment. It's a journey in the fog in a lot of ways. Um, some of the things that we're trying to do haven't been tried or been successful in other places, and that's the excitement of our five-year plan as we innovate. Other, uh, yeah. So that also describes exactly what we've been doing with Schooling by Design. This is a cycle that is in Schooling by Design. We've looked at it several times before. This kind of is the con ops for education in a way. So tonight, again, seeking approval as written of those six goals and 19 measurable objectives, knowing that further work when Dr. Marty gets here, the board retreat and things will be prioritizing strategies and action steps. I want to close um, the last pages of that book, The Fourth Way, uh, had this quote. This is actually the, how the book, entire book closes. They write, taking the familiar, well-traveled path is easy, even when it does not benefit children or their communities. It is time to step up and step out in order to reach a higher purpose and a better place. And then the final piece of the book, following right up on that, is, of course, uh, the famous Frost poem, I believe. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere, ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And you can see our house, and not that green arrow, but here's our CSIP heading there five years off uh, in, the, in the woods. A little... Uh, Are there any questions? Let me just say first, Tim, uh, thank you for showing us the way. <laughs> I know I came up in the first way, and now I'd like to say the fourth way is my way. <laughs> but I want to really comp uh, compliment uh, all of you, too, uh, on the recent visit to where our CSIP was uh, approved. And I, I really believe that, that that plan was just a byproduct of the work that came out of Project Parkway. I, I, and I think that's the way it has to be. It can't be the the end all. It's just one of those byproducts that comes out of the great work that we're doing in Project Parkway. And I'll open it up to the board for any questions that you might have of Tim. I'd just like to say thank you to Tim. A year ago, he stepped into some big, well, they're probably smaller shoes than you wear. I don't know. They weren't heels anyway. They're, they're right? different <laughs> kinds of, different shoes. Less, different shoes. Less, yeah. less pointed. Different shoes. Um, and you didn't miss a beat. Um, a lot of times, um, the members of the steering committee know we would spend all day and sometimes it felt like we were banging our head and I did not understand how things were going to form out of the things that we were talking about but you led the way and got it shaped up and it looks great um, and I, I really appreciate all of your hard work because um, that's, that's why we have what we have because of you and thank you.
Thank you. I appreciate and, that. And I just, just a little comment. I noticed um, you put the energy conservation and recycling. You got a nice little home for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> it's all starting to run together back here. Yes, but I'm sure it is. And, and I think you displayed your creativity tonight. So. <laughs> So as, as we all entered into this, uh, we kind of wondered where we were going, and I know Grant had a plan, and we believed in that as well. But it was absolutely incredible to see how this evolved over a period of time, and uh, the leadership of you and Jennifer at the time, and the commitment of the steering committee, and the discussions, and the questions, and the rethinking that went on to really formulate uh, what has happened as a result is absolutely incredible. It is exemplary. And, you know, involving the citizens to the degree uh, was absolutely incredible as well because they were engaged and they were involved and they really helped to formulate this as well. So it has a lot of credibility and it certainly will be a, a great uh, direction for the Parkway School District in the future for the students particularly. But thank you very much, Tim, for your leadership. Anyone else? Well, I certainly second those, those thoughts and particularly uh, Dr. Wiggins' comments uh, about the changes in administration and this, this process uh, is well beyond any single or group of personalities uh, in this room or in the district as a whole. And I think that's, that's the testament to the, uh, the integrity of the work steering committee and, and everybody who's been involved. Uh, the, the, no single agenda has, uh, and, and this was something we talked about very early on, is uh, the, <laughs> the fear of uh, capture of the process, which is the, uh, <laughs> not a military term, but uh, <laughs> kind of the, the classic uh, model of the, the bureaucracy that uh, tends to feed on itself and uh, turn into that self-licking ice cream cone, which is a military <laughs> term, by the way. <laughs> But I, I, I really do feel confident that we've, uh, people have embraced the process with integrity and, uh, and we are well past any of those concerns and uh, with some of the other work we're doing this evening. Uh, we, are, we are committing ourselves and, uh, and taking concrete steps to institutionalize uh, the ideas that we've, we've worked so hard to put together. So uh, certainly uh, for the remainder of my time on the board, and uh, and, I'll, and I'll wager the <laughs> the remainder of the time for the majority of the other board members, uh, we will be uh, zealous defenders of this process, and uh, and I am really excited about where it's going to take the district. Yeah, I, I appreciate you saying that. It is definitely bigger than than all of us, um, for sure. And. Thanks again to the countless folks uh, here and, and behind me who uh, I've been able to say, what do you think about this? <laughs> and uh, just tremendous people involved, uh, tremendous thinkers, and, uh, and leading the way, for sure. Yeah, remember the bad old days when we uh, actually felt uncomfortable looking at ourselves in the mirror? Hey, nothing personal, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments or questions for Tim? say thank you. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Well, I certainly want to thank everyone uh, who's been involved in this. I thank this board who believes in this process uh, from the beginning and as Bruce has mentioned even more zealously now and we're we'll continue to support you in that and I particularly want to thank Dee and and Sam who have been on the steering committee and have kept us informed as a board. We appreciate the many hours that they put into with that being said, then I'd like to ask for a motion and a second that the Board of Education, one, approve the goals, the six goals, and the 19 measurable objectives proposed by the Steering Committee for the 2011-16 Strategic Plan as written, and two, approve the general intent of the current draft strategies and action steps listed in the plan. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> I think we'd all like to make that motion. <laughs> I'm just glad she beat me before I asked for all in favor. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're delighted to say that this motion carries 7 0. Thank you all very much.
11.20, approval of the revised 2011-12 academic calendar, and we call on Paul Tandy, the Director of Communi Communications, to communicate with us. <laughs> Boy, after approving the CSIP, now we go on to the calendar. <laughs> How exciting. Buzzkill. Uh, before I begin my, my summary of the proposed revisions, I want to say I'm excited to be responsible for the uh, calendar. I don't actually sure exactly what I did wrong <laughs> to uh, be assigned this, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, I'm very excited to work on it. Uh, and this is my first time working on the calendar, so uh, forgive me if I uh, defer to Connie on a few uh, things. But um, as you know, we have a calendar committee that meets uh, annually to look at the future calendar. And uh, we met recently, and we were, we were going to look at the 2012-13 calendar to begin to develop that. And the first thing we did was review the existing calendar for 11-12. And in that review, several concerns were raised, and I apologize. We've had several versions of this calendar, and so, you know, my apologies and our apologies for coming back to you to even consider additional revisions. But as I put in the memo, we had a few concerns. First of all, the semesters were what we felt was uh, too imbalanced. If you notice, we had 86 student contact days in, in the first semester and 92 in the second. And we really try to keep those normally as close uh, to the same as possible. There were concerns raised both uh, from teachers and administrators about the May 25th professional development day, which was the day after the last day of school. Um, at the time, my understanding was the thinking was that would be a good day to do the curriculum writing. School year's over, it's fresh on your minds, you could do your curriculum writing. In reality, there were concerns raised that that would not be a, an effective day for that and that we should try to find a different day to conduct that very important activity. The third concern that was raised had to do with Good Friday and, and anal analyzing the last few years, looking at the attendance rate. Uh, as I noted in there, we've had a uh, significant drop in attendance, and normally we have 95% attendance rate. Last three years we've had 90%, 92 and 92. Uh, roughly 800 more students were absent this year uh, than on a normal day. And substitute teachers, we normally have about 40 subs. And for example, this year we needed 190, almost five times the number. Substitute pool has run out the past couple of years and we've had to deny uh, some requests for leave because we didn't have subs. And then, the, so we lose instructional time due to that, and we also spend about $20,000 a year on the subs. So the question was raised, could we uh, change that? So the three recommended changes based on that were to uh, provide a more balanced semester and the one being proposed would be 87 days in the first semester and 90 in the second. Um, and uh, basically what it, we would do is move the winter break one day to the right to do that. So we'd have one more student contact day in the first semester and you'd have one more day off in January at the end of the winter break, if that makes sense. The May 25th PD day would be moved during the winter break. So if you notice you'd have a extra PD day there for curriculum writing, which the committee felt like that was actually would work out pretty well um, in terms of being prepared to, to do some good curriculum work. And the final recommendation would be to assign Friday, April 6th, 2012, which is Good Friday, as a school closed day similar to the Friday before spring break. So with that, what questions do you have? I think these are all well thought out. Moves, especially the Good Friday. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing about fairness about religious days off, but there's also a practicality that you have to consider, and um, it, it doesn't make sense for us to have school that day, I don't think. I was surprised on the uh, attendance. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, didn't know the attendance was that mm -hmm. dramatic. And it seems to come up every year, so we, we need to address it. If you, uh, now, thinking about the effect on uh, families for this, this would not change the start day, mm -hmm. and it would not change the ending day to what has already been published. It would change the winter break, so it would shift it one day to the right, and you'd, and you'd have uh, 
a Good Friday off, but the starting and ending day stays the same. Now, if you did not do Good Friday, you would back the ending day to the, to the left one day. So just if you don't decide to do that. Although I don't know that parents would be all that concerned getting out one day sooner, but it, you know they do make, I know, plans based upon that. Any other questions, uh, board members, for Mr. Tandy? Kind of what did some of the other school districts do on uh, surrounding us on uh, Good Friday? It's kind of hit and miss. Some do, some don't. We wouldn't be the first one doing it by any means. Rockwood, Rockwood does it this way. In fact, that's one where one of our hypotheses is that they're... Well, we have teachers that live in Rockwood, so their kids are off. And yes. I, I guess I'm intrigued by the figure of $20,000 each day on subs. Is that due to the fact that uh, this was prior to this correction? Right. So, for example, we had 190 subs that we had to call in uh, on April 22nd, and there's there are about $100 or so a day per sub. Yeah. Yeah. On an hour average, so it's around you know 19 to thousand dollars. Now we normally have about 40 subs on a day. So it's, so it's big, not much bigger expense. Yeah, but it was just we just felt like we needed to quantify it for you. Okay. Any other questions? Then let me ask for a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve the revised academic calendar for the 2011-12 school year as presented in this May 4th, uh, 2011 board material. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries 7-0. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> he survived. And moving on to reports, 12.01, uh, the planning process for attendance areas. We welcome Desi Kershaw for to the podium and to help us understand where we are on that tonight. I think we have some graphics that are going to be kind of fun to look at. Have any of you seen Versa Trans? Mm -hmm. You haven't seen the Versa Trans, have you? The what? Versa Trans. Mrs. Kalanda, I hope that you'll send a message to the board docs people that how unresponsive this program, this new software seems to be. It's so slow to move anything. They don't want to talk to me. Oh, okay. Let me call. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, President Jacobs and uh, school board members and Dr. Senti and Ms. Kalanda. Uh, again, a logo that you should be familiar with and that was referenced quite a bit already tonight, Project Parkway seen it several times and it has helped move our work forward in many ways and, and one of those ways is um, the continuing look uh, one of the issues to be addressed was some of our overcrowding in some of our especially most pressing areas in the north area um, so tonight I want to provide just a, a brief update on where we are with our attendance areas and um, where we've been since the last time we've met uh, and discussed this in March 
Since our March board meeting, we've had a Connections Task Force meeting that also included uh, the uh, administrators from the North Attendance Area and uh, administrators from the Central Attendance Area as well. And we have two meetings with the Versatrans Corporation that uh, produces the software that helps us with our transportation routing systems. The purpose of those two meetings, um, one morning on, on the 31st of March and then the afternoon of April 1st, was to really learn about the process and how to make changes. Changes indeed were the answer to, to uh, fixing the overcrowding. And we were able to review a flat map, and I'll go into what that is in just a little bit, uh, that was created by the Versatrans Corporation. And then also an opportunity to create and start working on our own scenario too. And start to, really it wasn't about uh, getting a solution, but it was about learning how to do the process. And so I'll go into some of that. And then ultimately what we wanted to get out of the work with the consultant that was here that day was, was this the solution? Was this a, a viable option to, um, to change, was it changing the attendance areas? The, the, the answer could it be done through this process. And so I'm going to talk about the process first. Um, that day, and many people in this room were, were there as well, but we really had to learn about the process and um, kind of found out, I think, perhaps the biggest piece of it was uh, creating something called NPUs, which are considered neighborhood planning units. And really, to kind of break it down without going necessarily bullet by bullet there, it's when you take a, a, a neighborhood or a certain part of an attendance area that's kind of a larger area, and you break it down into really smaller pockets of, of land. And sometimes small really means um, condensed by population. Because you'll, you'll see in a map that I'll show you a little bit, there may be a big area that's considered a neighborhood planning unit, but there might only be one or two students in that entire area. And then you might see a real small, tight pocket where you might have 60, 80 kids in that planning unit. And so that's how they're, they're, it's really a manageable way to make changes without move, moving a huge number of students or an entire area at one time. So the consultant uh, prior to that day took our data and took um, our information to help with the process and developed what she called core areas. So she developed areas of NPU. First she took all those little areas and made, and I'm, I'm going to show you this in the map in a second, made a ton of NPUs. It, it'll look a little scattered when I show you the map. There's lines all over the place. But then to, uh, to start the process, once those NPUs were developed, she took like the closest ones that bordered a school, and that's, that was kind of what she termed the core area for an attendance zone. And so it wouldn't make sense. I mean, if, they're border, if the NPU was bordering that school, that's where the, that was the core area developed. And there were usually three or four core areas around each of our elementaries. And then what she would do is then to build her, her uh, scenario, she would start adding NPUs. And each time the software would allow her to show how many students then were added to the school. And so she kind of build out from that core unit and then until the school was kind of close to its a, a desirable level of enrollment. So. Let me show you a map. You see how congested it is. That is that's our, our district map. And um, you can see how many, those are all the little black borderline areas are all the neighborhood planning units that were developed in the system. And so when you see a real congested area with smaller things, that's a more populated area. And when you see a large area, there's going to be, uh, there were just less students in that area, so they were allowed to grow. I'm going to give you a little closer look. Uh, we gave a closer look more at the north attendance area. If you look, um, you can kind of see, um, and I don't Paul, do you have a pointer on you? No. Tim, do you have that pointer? Maybe I can point out some, some uh, highways and areas so you can kind of take a look. So if you take a look right here, that's uh, 270 and Highway 40. If you move up, there's Ledoux Road right there that comes in. And then to give you another kind of landmark, we have Olive right at the top. Um, so as you come up 
um, and most of these, while it doesn't show the streets, except for those major highways coming through, you can see some curves through the area that those are really built on some of the streets. Those are the, the uh, MPUs are developed using some natural boundaries, highways and streets and neighborhood cutoffs. Um, if you want to look at this area right here, if you talk about going up the, the uh, kind of Bennington corridor right there, the, the reason that's some of the apartment areas that have more students in one area, that's why there's a smaller breakdown of MPUs. And so each area, which it's hard to tell, but the little symbols inside there, they demonstrate which attendance area that is. For, for example, if you go to this one, if you take a look at this one, it's got a code by it. It says RB1, so it's Riverbend Attendance Area 1. So each one of them has a code in it and talks about uh, which pocket they would be in. Okay. Now this is a color map which now currently has our attendance areas on it and then it gets even a little, you see how it starts to get really even more congested. So now you have the NPUs bordering but then you also have the streets added to and then the color to uh, um, the current attendance and boundary areas right now. So to give you an example, we have Craig here, McKelvey up here, um, Bell Reeve here, Mason, Riverbend, Ross, so you get the general sense of where things are. Now what, what other things that the software used to be able to do or, or is able to do, it would take a kind of a line. So if um, um, Bell Reeve is here, it could draw a line to say over here and then tell you the, kind of the best routing system for our transportation and also kind of tell you the distance it would take as far as um, a kid closer to this school versus Craig Elementary and so those types of things. Now we did find out also in the process that even if the mileage um, may be more for a kid from the from the school that doesn't necessarily mean the route is more. And it may be actually uh, one example that was used we were taking an area up that is currently a McKelvey area right up around this neck of the woods and um, it was just as quick routing to go the back way over to River Bend than it was to actually take some of the routing because of it would be a one stop direct route versus pickups on the way to Kelby. So actually time on a bus, de it, it depended. It, it didn't necessarily mean just because of mileage, meaning you were spending more time on a bus. So it, it would help provide, uh, the software helped us kind of guide us on what may be the best routes. and. Um, if there's any particular questions, we'll maybe be able to answer some, some specifics on that. But, so that's the general idea um, and the, how in, uh, the neighborhood planning units are, are developed. Now what we were doing that day, we reviewed and we, we, we reviewed one scenario that the, uh, the consultant developed and then we started to practice our own. And I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about that. She considered a flat map. A flat map was the consultant's ability to view the district with an impartial perspective by just looking at the pure student enrollment, the guidelines, and natural boundaries. So without any other knowledge uh, and, and knowing that we had overcrowded in certain areas by looking at our data, by looking at what the desired enrollment was and what the current enrollment was at the school, she started to just create scenarios. And so um, in, in her... Uh, her map, looking at it, her solution was a big district-wide um, scenario that just took the elementary attendance areas into account. So she was trying to get as close to those numbers without any, without looking at where, where we prior were. So that would ignore one of our current board gu guidelines, which says move as few students as possible to another school. So that was, a, you know, while she did look and understand our guidelines. She thought, well, one solution is just let's, let's not cloud it with any judgment or any prior knowledge of what area is which or which. And so she developed a, um, and by doing so, she was able to show us the logic she used behind us. And, and I stated it earlier, she used those core planning units, developed them around an elementary school, and then built out and, try, and really just tried to do what seemed to make sense. And so, so we, that's how we learned the process through what she did to develop um, her uh, scenario 
And then um, after learning that, we had the elementary school principals from the area in the room. So she took them through the process and basically said, okay, show me what your core unit would be. And they were, and this is something that the board's going to be able to see and work with more in June, where um, Will is. Uh, dedicated some time to learn the software and is really working on it. So in June, the board will have a chance to be able to see the process and actually tap and move some things around and get an idea, a sense of how the numbers can change quickly and how the borders can, or the attendance areas can change quickly. But what we did is we allowed the um, elementary school principals one by one to come up and start really creating their own attendance areas. And so they would come up and kind of get their core area and then they would step back and We'd have some conversation with the people in the room, like which area, which next NPU seemed to be the best one to add. And so they would continue adding. And so we were able to get through, really uh, uh, and begin a working um, map with those principals in the room. So it was a really good start. Uh, there's a lot of work and details and projections to work out. So, but I think the most important thing we got out of it um, was that it was, a, it was a good process. And so in, in the end of the day, we were able to kind of gather as a group and come to the conclusion that really changing attendance areas by using the process and the technology provided through the Versatrans is a viable solution for the current overcrowding. So and I think ultimately that's what we went into the day saying. Um, I know when we first started, the Connections group was saying, it seems like the most logical place to start before you start spending lots of money doing other things. And so we did start the process and looking at it and investigating it and seeing how it worked, it does seem that that will address uh, problems. And maybe more importantly, um, now that we kind of, we've had those MPUs developed for us, um, I was talking to Will about this and, and Paul as well, that to address other concerns as it come to kind of anticipate what it might look like, what a change may be. So those, those neighborhood planning units really are the key to making a difference. And I know our consultants stress that big time. Um, so I wanted to present a tentative timeline tonight uh, for, for board to review. Um, but basically what we want to do is um, uh, really we've started working on drafting a survey to the, the areas that could be impacted uh, immediately or at least in 2012 um, in a survey kind of reviewing our current guidelines and that'll help. I know the board's been reviewing and, uh, and Paul's been working with a possible redraft of some of our guidelines. So before we wanted to do, bring that to you in June, we wanted to get some, a bigger input from the community on those. So we have two different sections in a survey that we're drafting right now that would uh, have people review them as a priority and then rank them down below and then some sections for comments. So if, are there other considerations that we need? So we'd like to send that out in May to be able to kind of provide feedback in June. And then a board pr presentation on uh, more of the uh, technology and the change process again and actually kind of get your, your work into it a little bit uh, during the retreat. Um, we'd also like to, in June, for you to review the survey feedback and the current guidelines to see which ones may be the top priority in the community, which ones seem to be the driving force. I know the task force that I worked on originally really struggled with a ranking of them and felt like they were all pretty, um, pretty important factors and so that's why we design, we're, we're working on a survey that says you, you can't have the option in one point to say yeah all these are important and then we're going to ask you in a second one okay what would you really have to do if it was on you so I want you to pick your top three and so we can get some different ways of, of looking at that data. Uh, so that's where we want to take it in June and this summer we would like uh, the administration to work with the district personnel and our transportation and facilities and get input from the Connections Task Force and then also uh, hopefully in July with our Project Parkway Steering Committee um, to develop an attendance area a, a scenario that would address the solution or address the issue and then um, in the summer fall also we'd like to have some ongoing dialogue discussion regarding the attendance area and change implementation. So if we're going to do this we, we still need before we would actually create the plan to be having conversations about what would it look for current students in the schools, would there be grandfathering, what considerations would there be for siblings, what will we do with special assignment requests and all those sort of things that we're going to would come up as a natural question on there. So first we probably need to anticipate what questions will come out and then have some dialogue about what our answers are to those questions. So that's an ongoing process through, throughout as we develop this. 
Um, then also the fall, summer, fall, we want to, um, as soon as we get and gather all that input, um, take it back um, for review for the board. And then this fall, we would like to take it to the schools and about the, the changes. And then uh, the possible vote would be uh, fall, winter, um, that the board would vote on any, uh, any um, recommended changes in attendance areas. And then the first implementation of that would be in August of 2012. So that's the timeline. And so right now our recommendation would be that we continue to work with the tools and technology provided by Versatrans this summer and uh, develop attendance area situations that would alleviate the overcrowding uh, for the elementary schools for the start of 2012 year. So that's, that's where our work uh, continues and uh, that's kind of where we are right now and we'll be able to bring you back some more information in June when we get some feedback from the survey and also give you a real strong in-depth working knowledge of, of how we will be able to use it for this, use the technology and tools for this situation, but then others that we may anticipate through some of our projections as well. Um, so those are the things we're looking at. Any questions? Dave? Um. Thank you for this, mm -hmm. um, and thank you for taking this on, and everyone who's involved in the Connections Committee. Well, I volunteered for the Calendar Committee. Paul, <laughs> Paul took that. Did you arm wrestle quickly. or something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, he's strong. He's got that military background. I know. He did some kind of trick. Um, and I, I suppose we'll go more in depth with, well, I know we will, at the board retreat and in, in the June meeting, we'll go um, more in depth with this. But I think we really need to take into consideration the diversity and the socioeconomics mm -hmm. of different neighborhoods um, when we plan this out because we don't want to set any school up to fail and we need to be just aware um, of that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to move all of the apartments to one school, you know, or, or keep all the apartments at one school. We have to just, you know, just to think about that. Yeah, it was, it was real helpful that day to have the uh, you know, while everybody's got a kind of a good broad view of yes. the, the areas, but the principals really knew to seem to know their areas very well, mm -hmm. and so it was really helpful in, in using the uh, the principals in the process. And I think we we'd continue. That's why good. we wanted to make sure that we can invite district personnel as needed. And I did have a parent call me, and I told her I would pass along her complaint. She's complaining that there aren't enough parents on the connections committee, and I assured her that this would. I, at, at, this is before I saw this, that we would be going into the schools, and I'm glad to see that it's already on here. Mm -hmm. um, but will there be, I guess through the surveys, that's their opportunity? Yeah, I um, think that's going to be our guiding force. What we've found, at, I think I've said this before, and, and maybe it's just at the connection meeting, the, the more people we seem to um, have, everybody was always in favor, you know, from the start, even in the small groups as we went through Project right. Parkway. Um, uh, they were all in favor of shifting a tennis series as long as it wasn't their own. Mm -hmm. And so that seemed, right. to, be, that seemed to be the issue. Um, that, sure, that seems like a logical, nobody argues that that's not a logical <laughs> issue except when it's their backyard. Right. Um, but I also would like, I just, I think we need to keep in mind, that's why the first slide of this is so important. For two mm -hmm. years we've had community, 300 plus community members involved in, in, the, in the actual identifying the needs and issues. And now I think it's time to take a little quiet work and kind of roll up the sleeves and get the work done. Um, which is, a, you know, that takes a smaller intense group, I think, to actually yeah. develop the, 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 the possible solutions. Right. So, and I think we're at that stage. Right, great. Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say and I forgot. I guess that's it. <laughs> I talk we'll, come to you. We'll, we'll come back to you. Any more uh, questions on this side? I guess the, <laughs> the, the importance of the integrity of the process, and when you mentioned rolling up the sleeves, we will absolutely demonstrate that there is nothing up our sleeves. Yeah, that's And the perception is, perception is king here. So mm -hmm. I think we're, we're putting it in black and white. We're very explicit about what we're the objective is and, and the process for getting there. And I think that's what we've got to all be familiar with and, and, and understand exactly yeah. where each step comes in the process. And, uh, and it absolutely is out there in the open. There's no it is. And I think the survey no magical will, will uh, elevate that <laughs> as well, solutions. just the, the conversations that take place. But, you know, it was a real struggle to look at those guidelines without knowing 
what people felt was their top priorities. And so that's really going to be important as we kind of work through it. So Absolutely. Thank well, you. I know what it was. <laughs> was it like Octoberish, Novemberish? You're thinking we'll vote on this, or if things go as planned? You know, I, 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 I yes, I, I think that's where so we're So we should all plan thinking. our vacations now. For I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not at all. No, no. You know what? We're doing the right thing for our kids. In the, is the right. bottom line. And so I think we do need to stick it out and stick together on this, and uh, and be very clear about what we're doing. But really, uh, it would be great. Um, October, November, to, because there's there's also some practical things that go along with it and logistical things, and and families would need to work on you know maybe make some decisions based mm -hmm. on it, but uh, I think ideally that would be it. Uh, I think we just have to find out as we get close to a real uh, viable solution to present. You know what is our feedback going to be and how to respond. So I think a lot of the preparation is going to take place this summer, but ideally, yes, October, November. And I think Dr. Marty's going to be a real big help on this mm -hmm. as he's gone through this in the district he's currently in. Um, so that's going to be a big help to us. Yeah, I, Dee, I'm glad you brought that up. And Dr. Marty has also worked with the Versatrans oh, group as well. So he was familiar with their software and, and their consulting uh, purposes and also felt like when we were shared our timeline with him um, that it was the appropriate thing to do and, and to move forward in this direction. Right. So we had kind of our uh, head nod and verbal the last time he was in town with it as well. That is good. Um, I have a kind of a technical question about the, the NPUs and how it working, you know, to establish that kind of like baseline to work from. Um, you mentioned six to eight kids. Um, is that roughly what an MP is based on? I mean, I mean you just are those just numbers that you're? No, there, it, it it really depends. There could be 60 to 80 kids in one so, MPU. Oh, 60, 60 to 80. Yeah, and then there 60. could be. I was going to say because statistically, I mean, if no. a family moves out or family moves in, it could throw the, the whole right. thing off whack there. Yeah. So. Well, and um, if you do it by, based on percentages, it could go really wacko because there was the one area in River Bend. It, um, and it was there's only one student, but it was a huge, covered a lot of square miles, but a lot of it was the flats and things down below um, by the river. So, um, so it's a, it's a little deceiving, but you could have a pocket that might have 60 to 80 kids in it, and then you might have one, you know, large area that has one. So really, it was a kind of about. Uh, she really looked at the natural borders and boundaries and tried to develop them around them, and then tried to uh, encompass. Uh, where it would make it, where it was changeable. The only thing that she kind of referred to is the MPUs that weren't really changeable would be that core area that was really central to right, right the neighbor around the school that it just it wouldn't make sense. And then, of course, our group had to laugh, and which she had no idea what everybody was laughing about. But it was about, uh, and she said it just wouldn't make sense to have kids that border the school right there and then everybody laughed about South Middle. <laughs> so, well, we happen to have one of our South schools indirectly in the West Attendance area. So, so. Uh, now, that this is, now that this is out, um, what kind of feedback is uh, happening out there in the schools? Are the principals hearing any feedback? Are you hearing any feedback? I, I think, it, you know, the conversation, I don't think it's changed much. Uh, since we first put it on um, a task force for people to sign up. I don't think that, I think, you know, and really, again, talking with Dr. Marty about it, he said that you're probably not going to get that until you, until, you, until you start talking specific neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to hear some things. But up until then, you'll, you'll hear conversations about something needs to put, take place, but again, it's always something needs to take place somewhere else, not, not here. But there really hasn't been a ton of feedback except that people know the conversations are going on. And people, I, I think there's a pretty good understanding of the need. And I, I do think that through the two years of Project Parkway, you know, that the need has been very clear and very upfront. Um, just the solution and how that might pan out is, is what. Yeah, I think that makes a difference. Uh, also, I, I really do think <clears throat> it's a good idea to have a decision sometime in the fall. Uh, because some thinking has to be given to the transition process. You know, to make it successful, that, that transition has to be well planned out by the schools that are affected, um, with the families involved, the students involved, and that'll make it successful, really. That, that's the, 
the crux of it all because once families know they're going to another school and they feel welcomed and invited and it's very nurturing, um, that will make the difference and that's something we need to think about. Yeah, absolutely. In transition and talking to some other districts, Lindbergh just went through a, a tendency area change and I know some of the principals that worked through there and some of the parents uh, who worked through the process. And uh, what was comforting um, is when, once the decision was made, I mean, there was, there was some angst along the way, there was no doubt about it. But once those families were welcomed into the other school and they had open houses and things like that that would invite the new families, it, it went over really well. Yeah, right. So I know they still haven't uh, fully implemented, but I know that some of the anxiety went away when they were able to meet the new principals, meet the new teachers and the grade levels and see that, you know, they, it wasn't going to be a complete group of strangers around them, that there still were people that they knew and still people from their neighborhood were, were involved in it as well. So, so it'll be a kind of a natural process of the planning for the next year. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and I think a key to, to your original question was about what's the conversation. I do think that, you know, part of uh, the survey, we, we will put an introductory letter with that, something to kind of introduce it so we can make sure that the dialogue is out there. And I think that may create some of the more of the feedback for, for, that we yeah. get from the principals and schools. Good, so. thanks. Is that going to go to every family? Every Parkway family or what? Well, right now we wanted to look, we wanted to focus in the areas that, that would be immediately impacted that we were trying to work on. So more than likely just the entire north okay. and central area. And, and while we can't predict the scope of it, but that's what it looked like when we were able to work through um, the situations at this point. But I think if, our, if we definitely see like the scope changing as we work through it, then we'd have to broaden that back and revisit it again. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, I, I have, uh, have Paul sign that letter. Paul Tandy signed that letter? Yeah, I think that's a great <laughs> idea. You know, you've made some decent decisions while you've been here, but that was, yeah. a, that was your best. That's okay. The transfer student uh, population and class size, is that going to be coordinated with all this? or? Yeah, it, it's part of our data that we've looked at, uh, all the enrollment numbers that we've classified it. But um, in, in categories and we also have to keep in mind I think we've said this from the start um, we weren't sure with the possible open enrollment bills or the, the, the Turner lawsuit you know what the outcome of all that will be um, but I think you know uh, by establishing our desirable class sizes and enrollment um, yeah that'll have to guide issues in the future of how we select and move students and those are some of the discussions that it talked about the extra things even special assignments because sometimes that's based on whether a school has capacity or not, whether a student would be issued a special assignment. So those are kind of the ongoing discussion dialogues that we just kind of have to keep up there all along as we go through the process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Desi, thank you very much. I, I do think of one, at one point we were talking about uh, looking at district-wide too, weren't we, just to make sure that if we're going to get beat up, let's do it one time so we get all the body blows in now. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, um, I don't know if we, we want to revisit that, but I certainly think that that, uh, you know, our the pressing issue still was where there's a, there's a need by 2012 to do this, and uh, the right thing for those schools, so we can get that out there. But I think that's the kind of the part about um, what this the technology allows us to do is it, we can continue to work and tweak areas and make some predictions, and uh, it's just the, the tools are right at our hands now, and so. Uh, Will Rose is just going to be an expert at this in the end. Well, thank you. We look forward to your re further report at the uh, uh, in June with the board. Very good. And we'll have the feedback from the survey there as well. So. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. 12.02 is the illustrious Liz. She's going to talk to us about teacher evaluation instrument. <laughs> We're going to get all wound up now. Hot potato. Yeah. Paul and I'll do it. You wanna? It's like good. Oh. <laughs> you gonna need this? Now that Liz is up there, this will be like doing calisthenics. I can feel it coming. <laughs> if Ron was in charge, he'd have us I thought they could put me at the end so I talk slower. You know, maybe she's tired. They knew they could wrap it up. Do you hear? No. Pointer? Okay. Back to Special thanks to Dr. Hudson for allowing the usage of his pointer. Talk about your spell. 
We'd rather watch you. <laughs> I don't struggle with that. President Jacob, uh, Vice President Feldman, Dr. Senti, Mrs. Kalanta, and members of the board. Um, I'm Liz Morrison. And I'm Jawanda Bozeman. And I'm Julie Pepper. And I'd also like to recognize we had a, uh, a very committed committee of about 50 teachers and administrators, and tonight we have some of those members with us. Um, Jill Loyette. Just a few. You know. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Kevin Beckner. Um, Bonnie McCracken. Becky Langrell. Lisa Meredith, Julie Collins, did I miss anybody? Thank you guys so much for being here this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, also, if you notice our title, it's the Professional Learning and Evaluation Model, and to tie in with Tim's work, um, well not Tim's work, the work of Project Parkway, um, was goal number four and goal number five, which um, is the professional learning and the, um, hiring great people and keeping them here in Parkway. The essential question that we have, and um, we've been talking about this a lot, was basically driven by the Board of Education and the work of Project Parkway, which is what evaluation model will best support the mission, vision, learning principles, and commitments of the Parkway School District? We only have one arrow, and it's pointing to the level on the house where it talks about... <laughs> and it's not green. And it's not green. But it's on our house, and um, I have a quote that I would like to read to you from the inspirational teacher. And it is this, the greatest thing in this world is not so much where we are, but in what direction we are heading. And this is from um, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Supreme Court Ju um, Justice, and that's exactly how we feel tonight. It's like where we are heading with the teacher evaluation model, and we feel like um, we're continuing the work of Project Barclay by doing what you guys have asked of us to tie in that with the mission, vision, learning principles, and commitments. Next, we have our enduring understandings, which you can read up there. We have an effective evaluation instrument provides feedback to teachers about their practice and connects to professional development. An effective evaluation instrument emphasizes collaboration between teacher and administrator throughout the process. An effective evaluation instrument must be designed in such a way as to facilitate consistency and use among evaluators and evaluatees. Highly effective evaluation instruments focus on mission-related student learning outcomes. Highly effective evaluation instruments provide clear descriptions of the role and responsibility of the teacher inside and outside of the classroom. And these have served as our guide as we've worked over the past year on our new model. Okay, if you're not on page seven, please turn to page seven in your booklet. Uh, these are the levels, three levels of experience. Uh, we have the new teacher, one to two years experience in Parkway, three to seven years of experience in Parkway, and then the career teacher, eight plus years experience in Parkway. And we didn't mention tenure here, but the level of support was based on the express needs uh, from teachers from the surveys that we did and this basically teachers said they needed more support um, based on that and it's also an effort to try and keep teachers in the profession I think we tend to think they leave after three or five but we found that we were having a lot more leave between five and seven The pages that you're looking at here are pages 8, 9, and 10, and I'd really recommend you look at them in your book, not on the slide, sorry about that. Um, what um, basically, you guys, is this is the visual overview of the process. And what we took in consideration as the team worked on putting this together was the feedback that we had received from both teachers and administrators about what was really wrong with our current model and the things that people liked about the current model and tried to move it into one um, really great plan for our teachers. 
So there's some key points I wanted to bring to your attention. First of all, um, there is a pre and post self-evaluation by our teachers using the domains of professional practice to help kind of get them to think about their own work and do reflection um, throughout the time. Um, our professional learning plan is a revised from the professional growth plan. We made the change in the title based on what was happening from the Learning Forward Organization, which is the National Staff Development Council's new name, and they changed professional development to professional learning, and we wanted to go with that. Um, as this is a cutting-edge document, we wanted to make sure we were cutting-edge with the titles of uh, the work that we're doing. Um, we have many observations, not, well it is many, but they are many. <laughs> um, one of the complaints that we had received from our teachers was they wanted people to come and watch them teach. But an extended evaluation where uh, an administrator would go in and sit in the classroom for the entire time was really limiting that experience. So we used the work of Kim Marshall and his idea for many, obser many, many observations um, in our, our work and that's going to be part of every teacher's experience every year in Parkway. We kept the extended observations. Um, they are a little bit different. It's not scripted like it used to be, but we kept those in um, primarily for our teachers who are non-tenured, um, teachers in year seven, and then we have a three-year cycle that will start where they'll have the longer extended observations as well. Um, and those can be announced or unannounced, um, and if you have an announced visit, it includes the pre and post meeting. Um, if it's unannounced, it would include a post-observation meeting. The mini observations have two components to them. One of them is uh, that to, for this to work right, there should be verbal communication between the teacher and the administrator within two days, as well as written communication. And we're going to show you that when we get to Peers 2.0 a little bit later in the presentation. Um, I need my cheaters. <laughs> some, other, um, some other things that we have on here, there's um, the uh, client survey is included for years three and five, and then also every third year in your cycle. Um, and you guys, we thought about doing the client survey every year for every teacher, but then if you think about the high school schedule, right? So I have, um, I teach, let's say I teach U.S. history, and I have six sections of kids, but those kids actually have eight sections of teachers, so a student would have like eight evaluations to do every semester, and we're thinking after evaluation number one, they probably wouldn't pay any attention to what they're marking. So we wanted to make sure that when we were doing the client surveys, we would get back good responses. We will also have client surveys for all of our age kids, but what we have for the kindergarten students is gonna, will look very different from what we have for our high school students. And uh, Dr. Nathan Tyson, if he's still in the house, is gonna be helping us um, put those together so they're really valid surveys as well. Did I miss anything from our academic? Good? Okay. All right. Oops. Okay. Ready? Good. Uh -huh. So next we have our guidelines. And um, the evaluation responsibilities are clearly defined for the HR department, building administrator, and the teacher. The formative process, and Liz has kind of outlined this. Right. So the formative process provides ongoing data to support the summative evaluation. The evaluation is based on a portfolio of work obtained over time. So again, for the teachers that are in year one through five and year seven, they will be receiving a summative evaluation. And then teachers that are career teachers will have a summative evaluation every three years. Can we talk about that? Oh, that's okay. Uh, one other thing I want to add to that, too, is if a teacher is perceived as ineffective in any of the areas, a discussion and documentation must occur <coughs> prior to that being placed in their summative evaluation. So we wanted to point that out. So everybody's very aware of any situation that would be a concern. Um, where are we? <laughs> ready? Yeah. I'm ready. Okay, so our evaluation is based on the domains of a pro professional practice. They, uh, that's the foundation um, for the teacher evaluation model. And that is evident in the teacher's self-assessment, the initial conference that takes place with the professional learning plan, then the implementation, and the end of the year conference. In the domains of professional practice, the, uh, you see here it says the effective teacher. That is the target. And it says the effective level describes solid expected professional performance. Um, we have, these are the 
four ratings, ineffective, um, development area, effective, and exemplary. And then you have the domains of professional practice, which are, you should be able to read those, I think, planning and preparation for learning, uh, learning environment, instructional process, monitoring, assessment, and feedback, and professional responsibility. And you guys would also like you to take a note at the bottom of page 20, um, where it talks about the mission, vision, learning principles, and commitments, and you can barely see it up on the screen. But as we were charged to do as a group, we took our mission, vision, learning principles, and commitments and embedded them into the teacher evaluation model. And this goes with that idea about institutionalizing, and I can't remember who said that from the group, but it institutionalizes these into what we do in our daily practice in our classrooms. And so in the document, the ones that are actually verbatim from the mission, vision, learning principles, and commitments are in italics, and they have um, an indicator of either an MV, LP, or C, so people know exactly where those came from. This is really cool. Um, <laughs> Carol, um, Carol Conan um, took the words from the domains and put them into a wordle. And so the words that really jumped out were students, learning, and knowledge. And then you can see student again without the S on the end. And this was really our goal, was to make a student-centered document that was aligned with our mission, vision, and learning principles. And um, I have a couple more quotes for you guys. And I didn't put them up in the slides. I like to read them out of the book. So here's one of them. It is a great teacher's, um, in a great teacher's classroom, every student feels like the favorite. And the most important action an effective teacher takes at the beginning of the year is creating a climate for learning. And you guys, I didn't just pick these quotes because they really went with our wordle, which they did, but I also picked them in honor of my friend and colleague, and as well as Julie's and many people here, Mark Wade. Um, he passed away on Saturday, and uh, I had the opportunity to go to his memorial service and to the wake today. And the students wrote many, many comments about Mark. And one thing that they said was that uh, <laughs> every student in Mark's class was his favorite student. And at the memorial service on uh, Tuesday night, they asked the kids in the crowd, if you were Mark's favorite student, to please raise your hand. And they all did. And um, he also had a strong commitment to student learning. And the quote from Mark Wade that has to go with the knowledge piece is, uh, teach good math. And so um, I just wanted to honor Mark, and it really went with our, what Carol created with our Wordle on student learning and knowledge as kind of the foundations for what we're doing in our teacher evaluation model. Yeah. <laughs> Once again, a very clear slide, but if you turn to page um, 21, this starts our domains of professional practice, and these are the rubrics that go with it. So if you'll notice, you guys, we added some visual um, information here to help people see what the document is. The red on the document is the effective category, and that is the target for our teachers. And I think the quote that I read, that was from the National Teacher of the Year, that effective really is a great target for the teachers that we have in our classrooms. And so effective is the target that we're hoping that every teacher will meet in Parkway. The dark black line was put on to separate what is acceptable from what is unacceptable. And when Julie was talking, she had mentioned about being marked as ineffective. If this happens, this moves our teachers into the performance improvement plan, but that needs to be done prior to their summative evaluation because it's not fair to do it at the end when we could help them all along with our many observations as well. Um, also, we added at the bottom of the page, there's an asterisk by exemplary. One of the things that we found when we took this on the road, when Jawanda and I went to many schools, <laughs> all of them, um, was that the teachers were confused about exemplary sounds very different from effective because it really is another category of performance. So what we wanted people to understand is you must be everything in effective. Then you can be exemplary so you, because they're just kind of different twists on the same thing. So that was something we wanted to point out as well. So the, um, we have the rubrics, and these are the ones we were talking about that the teachers would be using for their self-evaluation, and these are the backbone to our entire process. Speaking of process. Speaking of process. So okay. here is how the <laughs> process will go. Um, a professional learning plan will be filled out by each teacher 
and they'll do that after they have completed their assessment using the domains. So basically what will happen is the teacher will go through the domain model and do a self-assessment. Um, then they're going to summarize their thinking in the domains and in the appropriate area where those arrows are, as you can see the arrows, they will develop their professional learning plan. So the teacher will establish the learning goal, which should be a result of the self-assessment that they have done with the domains. Okay, the first one there, I don't know if you can't see the screen very well, you can probably see it better in your uh, booklet, are the mini observations, that's the uh, feedback form, um, and then there is the pre-observation worksheet that will, uh, the conversation that takes place between the teacher and the evaluator. And then there's the extended observation that Liz referred to earlier for um, maybe a teacher might request to have a longer observation or there might be some reason for that other than a request. And then there's also the professional improvement plan for those teachers um, who would be in the ineffective um, and just kind of a reminder that ineffective would only appear on a summative evaluation if the teacher knew that it was coming. It should not be a surprise. And then there's the, uh, the evaluator completes this rubric and adds comments as appropriate. And then the teacher receives the rubrics and completes a reflection on his or her work. And so, you guys, we were not competing with Tim for the most arrows in one slide, so it might appear that they were, um, but all of those slides are heading towards what we wanted to really focus on, which was that the domains of professional practice are in every piece of work that goes with it, making them really the backbone of the entire system. Oh, and if you remember, uh, I presented the idea of Pierce 2.0 to the group um, a couple months ago, and um, we have that for you. To, oh, whoops, or not. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. Keep your fingers crossed. Yes. Okay, so um, I was presenting this to principals, and I forgot to log in, so I'm not going to forget that today. Yeah, you know what it is. <laughs> Same everywhere. <laughs> okay, so Piers 2.0, what you're looking at is the beta version. This will be ready to go um, when our uh, principals come in for their training. And the evaluation piece, this is very exciting. Uh, when Dan Tripp, uh, who worked with uh, Logic Blast to put this together, showed it to me, I cried. I couldn't believe we were actually, it was everything that I dreamt of and more for this. Um, as you notice, you guys, if you've ever worked with peers, it's, this is much, uh, it's more user friendly, it's just more attractive. You know, there's still something to be said for that. Um, this is the summative evaluation form. Um, it's awesome. The principals are going to be able to select their teacher off the list. They put in the school year the subject and grade. This is going to look a little bit different when they're done. Um, we're still working on it, but when the administrator clicks on planning and preparation for learning, the rubric will pop up for them. Let's see if I can go to go back out of here. Um, the mini observation form, which Jawanda showed you. This is what it looks like for the administrator. Once again, they can select their teacher. They do the time in and time out. They can actually do this if they wanted to on their BlackBerry right when they're in there. They could do it on their laptop if they brought it in. Or they can do it later, um, whatever works. It has the domains, place for them to put in their comments. If they hit save, um, it, they can save it. If they hit save and complete, it automatically sends an email to the teacher's mailbox saying that you have a comment and the link takes you back into Pierce so the teacher can read their work and then they can respond back to the principal. <laughs> Isn't this just great? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just have to show you the one, um, the self-assessment rubric. So I'm coming in to do my self-assessment. This is going to be a paper document as well as an um, electronic document because it really is for me. When I click on the box, 
the whole domain pops up down here. I can evaluate myself by clicking on the, I think I'm exemplary in every category. Okay. <laughs> and then at the bottom, I can come down and put in any comments that I have, might have so the That's administrator will know how great I am. <laughs> so, um, you guys, we're so excited about this. Um, what's really cool, too, is that with when, um, let's say Kevin came in to do my mini observation on me and he marked that I was um, effective in something that he saw, it starts filling in the rubrics. So when Kevin goes back to look at the end, when it's time for my summative, it really has kept kind of a running record of where I, I am and where I'm going. Um, it's very, very exciting that we're going to have this technology available. So I'm glad I got to share it with you. Okay. And there's more. I mean, just, well, you, never mind. <laughs> it's going to be so cool. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Here's what's coming in August, so coming soon. The domains for other job categories, so the librarian, media specialists, counselors, technology, integration specialists, and any other job categories that we have. Yeah. I think we hit most. Literacy code, yeah. All of those will have their domains that are specified for their job. And then the complete professional development plan the complete glossary with all the terms that you need to know and what they mean, and the, a guide to best practices. Um, one thing that we think is very important too, and it came from, um, I think it was uh, Mr. Majors who mentioned this about how do you make a good transition, maybe it was Sam, about how we, we make a transition successful. And one of the things that we know when you bring in anything new, whether it's boundary changes or a new teacher evaluation model, you have to have a good plan in place. And we believe that we put together a great plan to transition to this. So for our administrators in June of 2011, we have um, a day of training for them to learn how to do the mini observations, which is new, and some other pieces to um, the new observation um, and evaluation plan that are different. Um, then we have a team of Kevin Beckner, um, Bonnie McCracken and uh, Sarah Power and myself who will be working with our administrators on like how you use the peers piece and stuff later on in both June and July. Um, also attending the group session in um, June will be a team representing our um, the PNEA, to make, so they hear the same thing as well. We think that's going to make a really smooth transition. And then during the school year, um, the development days that we have for our administrators, those will be working on the successful implementation of the new plan. So, and in addition to that, um, we have a representative from each level, a high school representative, middle school, and an elementary uh, teacher who will be at the same workshop with the administrator. So we think that'll be great as well. Um, and then for the teachers, development this summer, 2011, and then August 9th is when the administrators and a teacher leader team will get together, and then we will have, then they're going to roll that out, right, for, the, mm -hmm. yep. for every school. So we're going to have on the 9th a special um, development for two people in every building who will then in turn be the people that come to their buildings and share with them the new model. And then, of course, the <coughs> teacher development piece with new teachers coming in, this really, it will be new to them, but it, they won't know the difference because it will be the only evaluation some of them have ever had. So they will, um, we will have an orientation for new teachers and then um, the back to school, um, right now we're thinking August 11th, shortly after the um, welcoming or kickoff for Dr. Marty. Um, one of the things that we, was another um, issue that was brought out uh, in Project Parkway's research was that um, once the old document was created in 1998, it wasn't revisited. 
And we don't want that to happen again. We don't want it to be that when we look at this document in five years that we hadn't looked at it in that time, and then you have to, st you know, you really have to throw the baby out with bathwater because you have to start all over again. So what we have is a plan of action so we can make sure that we keep looking at the document. So the first year we'll be sending out a survey in December, very short survey. Another one in, um, oh, and then the group will come back together, hopefully our, our committee of 50 um, in January to review the results of the survey, make any changes that we think just seeing right there send updates out. Once again, we'll do it in May. We'll get back together and work on the document. Any change that we, we decide we need to make based on feedback we received, we'll get those out into the, um, everyone in August when the administrators will review the process again. And that's what this is too, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this just um, kind of underlines those yearly reviews. Late spring, we'll be surveying the teachers and administrators, and then in the summer, we'll have a chance to sit down and look at the results and what we should adjust for the next school year. And it was interesting because I don't think our committee realized when they were got together in July that this was a lifetime commitment to the teacher evaluation model. But once you're on, you're on. <laughs> yeah, once you're on, we don't let you go. We have your names. So, um, yeah. And, that let, and I just borrowed this from Desi, this swirling question mark. We really like that. So um, now, if you have any questions for us, we would be happy to answer them. Oh, I and thought also, they were supposed to put them in writing. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> So if you have any questions, and also uh, Kevin and Bonnie and Jill, if you guys want to answer them too, you're more than welcome to do that. Well, I think I know where uh, Everready got their model for the <laughs> Energizer Bunny. <laughs> And I just want everybody to know that I was the model for that little chubby guy under my, my courses and, and staff support. <laughs> any, any question? It's, what a great work. This is very extensive, and I think the teachers are going to feel very much supported by it. Any, any questions? Just a Pete. comment. I cannot believe how far you've come. I mean, I, I yeah. thought this was going to, oh, it'll be two years before then. And what a great start for our um, Project Parkway work. Uh, I mean, I feel like we're a year ahead of where we should be, and um, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you all. And I've heard great comments about the traveling team that's gone from school to school. Um, so the traveling road show or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. like, but c congratulations. Job well done. <coughs> Recently, I've gotten a lot of compliments about everything that was done what, this year. But at the beginning of this year, I remember talking about what we planned to do work on, and we talked about the teacher evaluation system. I said, hey, you couldn't possibly do this in this in, in this year. So it's amazing that you've gotten this done. That's my first comment. The second one is to have the PNEA and you making the presentation to the school board. It's just a wonderful thing. So, thank you. Any other comments? I guess just, uh, and, and hate to be a, a fly in the ointment, but, and I'm not, haven't, haven't been tracking the uh, state legislature uh, too closely, but uh, do we anticipate any uh, gifts from Jeff City which may impact our uh, model or is that seem to uh... okay <laughs> <laughs> since, since we are now cutting edge <laughs> well, I just want to reinforce the the thanks and the, and the appreciation, there has been an awful lot accomplished uh, since whenever that last rainy slash snowy Monday night over at the high school and uh, there was a bunch of, there were a bunch of ideas on the table and, uh, and now we're looking at a, at a coherent and, uh, and, and I think substantially streamlined process. So thank you all very much. I have a question. Have you guys given any thought to what kind of time commitment this is going to take out of an administrator's day and compare that to what time they're, they're investing in these evaluations now? And is it really going to be doable? Viable, Kathy, isn't that your word?
allowing the technology, whoever was responsible for that, to put it up, let them use their Blackberries. We don't have to buy additional equipment. We don't have to buy an iPad or a Zoom or whatever for them to go in and do this. They use a laptop, they can type in. It's hard. I, I'm not good at typing with my laptop. Right, but, but it'll work in a pinch. So that's great. That's really great. I, I too, want to compliment you on a tremendous, tremendous job with all of this. Uh, you know, as, as you work with principals and training principals into this process, many of them don't need a whole lot of training, but others new because there are a lot of new people. But, you know, I think the, the conference, you know, the post-observation conference is really critical. And, and I think, if anything, to have some guidelines or some suggestions in terms of what makes it an effective conference, that not, it's not only saying, well, here's what I think as the administrator, but getting the teacher to be actively engaged in self-reflection of that lesson and all. I, I, I think some guidelines for that particular element of it would be really critical and very important. Right. Well, <laughs> well you know, having been there a lot, uh, you know, it's... It, you just need to know what, what are the key elements to talk about in that reflection, that responsiveness to the observation. That, and it, it ought to be something rather consistent, too. Well, it's important that the teacher leaves feeling that this was just a, a really good conference, a good feedback, good chance for me to express what I think I'm doing and how I'm doing it as well. So. Question? Oh, Helen? Uh, when I first saw this um, on our system, uh, I guess it was, what, a m m month ago, maybe? That's when it first came out. I thought, how wonderful. I just, I zipped through it, and I thought, you know, I wish it, I had had this years ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, how did you, just, I have got a, cu a couple questions. Uh, how did you determine where the breakdown would be as far as evaluation, like uh, years one and two, three and seven? <laughs> I also want to ask, uh, will this be, um, like any other evaluation, part of the personnel file?
Uh, yes, okay. I had asked about the personnel. And oh, yeah. uh, one more thing. Um, I'm doing a D. I just I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, if you can find your way home, you don't have Alzheimer's. <laughs> <laughs> if you know you have a home. Um, <coughs> oh, my. Um, okay. If, for example, um, uh, you're uh, evaluating, uh, the administrator's evaluating a teacher, and um, at the different levels, and I haven't really read it that thoroughly, each, each part in here, but um, is there a point where maybe, uh, like if you needed two evaluations, that there might be three or four? If, some, if there's an area of concern. Right. Thank you for completing my sentence. Yes. And we put a minimum number on there, like three to five, but, but an administrator might come in more if they, if they feel like that's necessary. And they would obviously, hopefully, communicate with the teacher about what's going on as well. I, so, say, I think yeah. the communication that there is a concern first mm -hmm. and then a plan of what they want to do as far as working with that teacher. Mm -hmm. at, at what point would there be a, a and, and we assume that you know everything will be improved and, and uh, if there needs to be improvement. But at what point would you say, you know, we need something more? We need so, like the professional improvement or the professional improvement plan would come into action. If they, right. they professional ineffective. improvement plan, uh -huh. and uh, I, I'm taking it to the extreme. I don't right. expect this, but right. I'm just saying, how far do you go with this? As far as I would, I think we're following the same process as far as what happens when anyone does a professional improvement plan. How long you have to fix that? Mm -hmm. um, it yes. has to be part of the plan. It has to be part of the plan. So, but you guys, any time that if, if someone came into my classroom, and I always use the one monitoring assessment and feedback, because um, there's a one about student goal setting in there, and I thought I taught American government, right? So the goal was for the kids to pass my class or they couldn't graduate. So I thought that was pretty simple, but that's not what they're talking about for student goal setting. So if my administrator, <laughs> Kevin Beckner, who just gets to be my administrator, notices I don't do any of that kind of thing, he might know that I'm ineffective in that category, and we need to start working on it right then, flips me into that performance improvement plan so I can fix that. But some, some of the things on here, I don't think some of the teachers have done before, so we're hoping this first year is kind of an exploratory year of, wow, I had never really even thought about that before because I didn't know that was good practice. So um, that's what we're hoping this first year is really developing everybody on those. Good. Thank you. Very well done. Well, thank you. I think the important thing here is it's part of our mission to go after all of the students, and yes. this is going to help us get there. It's going to help a lot. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. It always goes so much faster when you're talking. I'm sure those guys in the back are like, come on! <laughs> <laughs>
uh, I think if, if anybody else has <laughs> waded into this one, it, uh, it starts with a series of <laughs> rather daunting definitions and uh, subcategories. Uh, I think this is a uh, <clears throat> mandated by our friends in Jeff City, uh, and I think it addresses a problem which has not been an issue within the confines of Parkway School District for uh, many years, but uh, may well be an issue uh, in the rest of the state more so. But uh, if, <laughs> if you get, could give a little uh, the background and history, from a thumbnail sketch. From, from my perspective, and I think Michael's as well, there are relatively few cases of restraint in the district. Um, most of those probably are special education students who are restrained by special ed staff. They've had a policy in place for quite some time that involves extensive documentation, uh, checking students uh, at the nurse's office and so forth. Um, but for, in general, most of our physical contact with students has been breaking up fights and, and things of that sort. So not too much of an issue in our district. Uh, I'm not even sure to what extent it's an issue around the state. Uh, I had a, seen an article in July or mid-April from Orlando, Florida, and they made reference this school year alone over 8,000 restraints in the state of Florida. So it's it's a much bigger national issue, and there is talk of uh, the federal government passing some laws regarding restraint. Okay. So um, it, it apparently it does happen much more frequently elsewhere. Okay. And then as far as the, the specific requirements, there's some, some reporting forms if there is an incident of restraint and that sort of thing. And uh, I guess the, does that present a, a bold new universe for us or is it uh, fairly? We document everything, you know, in terms of, in the area of discipline, for instance, we document everything, um, centralize it on the database as well. So Steve and I were just talking about doing the same thing with any time we, we have to document one of these cases, we send a, find a database that could hold all that information. Okay. And, and I would not doubt that there will, this will be included uh, in, in the Office of Civil Rights reports that we get every couple of years, and so we're going to have to have it on our database, and we'll okay. be able to report, report out on it. Well. Yeah. And, and reading through the, the language, it, uh, it gets very inclusive as to <laughs> who, who is an active agent for the district, which would include, it appears to me, uh, parents who are, on a, are going on a field trip with uh, students and that sort of thing. Uh, so I guess the, the issue of, uh, I, I understand there's going to be a, what, a, a flyer or something that talks about the, the basic outline of the, of the policy. Well, as far as how that gets we have quite a to number, and you can ask staff, uh, <laughs> quite a large number of um, required trainings that have to happen every year, and this will probably be added to that, uh, and that will be a, a broad overview of the policy and some of the uh, general issues related to this. Uh, but then we will be required, and we will be doing systematic in-depth training in all of our schools um, in, in specific areas of focusing on de-escalation of students, uh, safety for students, safety for staff, and if and when necessary, proper restraint techniques. So there'll be two levels of training. Uh, certainly the latter one is going to be much more systematic and comprehensive. Okay. And are, would some of that be online training or have well, you... Well, the one for all that? staff will be. Right. Okay. This, but the, the more in-depth training will, will... We talked about having the schools develop teams um, for each building and those people will have more in-depth one-on-one training okay. on a yearly basis. And I, and I guess my point would be there, it, this includes volunteers in the school. I think we do have a fair, fairly substantial volunteer community. Do we have a, a way to track I think those? the volunteers probably need to be aware of our policy, but they will not have gone through systematic training and therefore right, will right. not be qualified or... Yeah, under, understand. Not want them I think there's, some, students. There, there's there's right. an awareness level that right. that we're mandated to 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 account for. Right. So, okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. And I don't know if anybody else had any questions on the topic. Any other questions? I'm um, just wondering, uh, does the SSD uh, policy complement ours, or is there a conflict with our policy? Is there any conflict between the two policies? Are they pretty much at this point in time? They're pretty similar. Uh, theirs does address um, 
secure observation rooms because they have those in their buildings and our policy does not, but for the most part they overlap a lot. Mm -hmm. Good. And as we've been working on the policy, they've been sending us their drafts and we went to a, a workshop at um, SSD's administration building with other mm -hmm. districts from the, from the community to make sure all, we're all kind of looking at the same issues with the policy. Yeah. And who's involved in the debriefing? Uh, I know it states basically in the policy that within two days it needs to be accomplished. And one, one thing is two days too long to debrief a situation. And also who's involved in the debriefing? I mean, I'm sure the person involved with the actual issue would be, but uh, does the principal get directly involved in every situation? Um, are parents brought into it? I think it's it spelled out in... There, there's some specificity spelled out, but for the most part, I think it's people who um, were involved in the incident plus anybody else that would have relevant information. information. Um, I, I think it would be, when we do manifestation determinations with respect to discipline incidents, the concept is relevant members of the IEP team, so I think we would rely on the judgment of administrators to determine who might have relevant information. So it may be the people directly involved, right. But if it's an issue where they want to look at what strategies or interventions we might want to put in place to prevent further occurrences, theoretically they would expand beyond those people yeah, that were directly yeah. involved. That's and, yeah, and, and it outlines it here, the, the staff directly involved as well as the building principal. Right, right. So do we have uh, these uh, secure observation rooms in our... We do field? not, no. no. No, we do not. And, don't, and don't anticipate having them either. Well, I think we decided we're going to do exercise rooms before we do rubber rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the board for these gentlemen? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. These uh, four policies will be moved to the June 15, 2011 board agenda uh, as a consent items for approval. 15.0, call for a special meeting. None. 16.0, call for an executive session June 4th and 5th, 2011. 15. June 4th and June 15th, 2011. Could I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education call for an executive session on Saturday, June 4th, 2011 at the administration building and on Wednesday, June 15th, 2011 at 6.30 p.m. and or immediately following the regular meeting at Central Middle School for the purpose of considering one, legal actions, causes of action or litigation involving the district and any confidential or privileged communication between the district or its representatives and its attorneys, 610.021.1. Two, hiring, firing, disciplining or promoting of particular employees by the district when personnel information about the employees discussed or recorded, 610.021.3. Individually identifiable personnel records, performance ratings, and records pertaining to employees or applicants for employment, 610.021.13. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ms. Kalanda? Mr. Applebaum? Yes. Mrs. Castillo? Yes. Mrs. Feldman? Yes. Mr. Major? Yes. Mrs. Mogerman? Yes. Dr. Santino? Yes. Mr. Jacob? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Let me ask then for a motion and a second to adjourn the regular meeting of the school board tonight. All in favor? Motion. I'm sorry. <laughs> so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries 7 0. At this time we adjourn and we'll see you. <laughs>